Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests of honor, let me all welcome you at today's conference on behalf of the organizers, namely the Faculty of International Relations here at the University of Economics in Prague and myself, Roman Kupati. Uh, the theme we shall tackle today, and you all know it, of course, that's why you're here, is sharing economy present and future state of affairs, if you will. Uh, I would dare to say, and I, I think, I expect many of you to agree, that uh, it is a very, very, very timely issue, topic, uh, and also very relevant indeed. Some of you who came on Monday know, understand what I'm talking about. Those of you who live in Prague or visit often and experienced what was happening again understand. Uh, we had huge traffic jams, hours waiting in cars due to cabby protests. That's disruption in practice, the disruptive pause that is coming with sharing economy uh, and new economy in more general terms. Uh, music industry and some other segments, sectors of economy, have been already revolutionized. Uh, others, such as automotive, we will talk about automotive very soon, housing, movies, and others are about to experience 
the full force of this disruptive force. Uh, there are some guesstimates. Uh, you are probably familiar with the 2025 and 300 and approximately 35 billion dollars, which is always connected, or often connected with uh, sharing economy and its potential, meaning that it would uh, be 20, 21 times bigger than in 2015. Uh, in eight years time, but I think that it's much more about that, about numbers. It is about that disruptive force, about new, completely new take on things that we've taken for granted for years. Uh, let me quote Joseph Schumpeter in this connection, uh, something that I feel is highly relevant. Uh, 75, ladies and gentlemen, 75 years ago he said, one day, there will be a new commodity, new technology, the new source of supply, the new type of organization. It will emerge and it will be more relevant than perfect competition. Uh, Schumpeter described this as a competition which strikes not at the margins of the profits and the outputs of the existing firms, but at their foundations and their very lives. Now, how could and should both disruptors and disruptees, if you will, meaning companies such as Uber, Airbnb, or, or blah, blah, on one hand, and established players, both market players and public sector, tackle, utilize the potential, and at the same time lessen the threats or problems connected is a big question, a question that we are going to tackle, address today. I'm very pleased to say that we have leading international experts on sharing economy, as well as key domestic players, stakeholders that will provide for a local context. Before I ask them to take over, and before that I will address a couple of technicalities, I would like to ask the Dean of the Faculty of International Relations here at the University of Economics, Josef Tauscher, uh, for his opening remarks, or more generally, or more specific, take on uh, shared economy. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear director, distinguished guests, let me welcome you here at the Faculty of International Relations Annual Conference, Sharing Economy, Reality and the Future. As we have heard, the topic is very up to date, especially in the context of the recent developments in the Czech Republic. This event is following our conferences from previous years. Uh, these were conferences on competitiveness, which we organized to discuss the results of a global competitiveness report as we are a partner of World Economic Forum on this initiative. And we are still working on that, but we have decided to come up with a new conference, a little bit new format, but still keeping our commitment to contribute to public debate on issues which are both interesting for our research field and also important for development of economy and society. We have two very interesting panels, but before, before we start with the first panel, I would like just to share a few thoughts with you about the topics which will be probably discussed today or for sure discussed today. The sharing or collaborative economy has become a massive phenomenon in recent years. What we are facing is, a, we can say, true revolution, peer-to-peer -peer services where people uh, rent things together, share things together, instead of owning them. Sharing has a huge economic potential, and it's uh, also an uh, important source of additional income for the people. As we have heard, it's a big industry. According to European Commission, in 2015, uh, gross sales were about, or gross revenues were about 28 billion euros, and it will grow, it will grow a lot. According to PwC study, as we have heard, about 20 times till the year 2025. 20,000, I'm sorry, 2025. 
This all sounds amazing, but what about our society, our legal systems? Are we ready for it? Of course, the issue of adjusting and finding the legal options for sharing economy varies country by country, not only in the Europe, but also in the world. And some countries, uh, some countries have completely banned some services. Some are looking for the options to recognize them and give them the opportunity to operate. However, under local law or specific conditions. Here in the Czech Republic, we have been witnessing the protests a few days ago, what also shows some limits of our legal system. The traditional laws were never designed to cover the current business models and new services that sharing economy has brought with. Another problem which can be considered to be crucial is the question of taxation. The new platforms based on sharing whatever they offer and intermediate, they are legal subjects which are part of the economy and should be subject of proper taxation as well. I don't want to say or I don't think that the new business needs to be banned. We cannot behave like ostriches before new trends and ever evolving economy, innovations and ideas around us. The courage of justice of the European Union as well as the European Commission are showing EU member states what the solutions might be. But this is not enough. We need also to have some political will to move further. We need more concrete actions and reforms of old-fashioned law and to draw a line which would be the same for everyone. Doesn't matter whether it's new business or traditional cab driver with license or additional insurance. The conditions on the market should be the same for everyone. No businesses should have a comparative advantage just because of being in the gray zone or beyond the law. There are many questions related to the topic. What is the sharing economy and how to distinguish between proper business and sharing economy? To what extent is property renting beneficial to the cities? what are and should be the ways how to protect the consumers and many others. I hope we will answer these questions. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me and I am very proud that we organize such event here. I am very happy to see all distinguished guests from academia, Professor Googler, from business, PwC, blah, blah, car, and also policymakers from Czech Republic as well as from European Commission. Special thanks goes to Mr. Kale Paling because he flew today morning directly from the Estonia just for one day to share his experience on, on ride sharing and its regulation in Estonia. I'm very much looking forward to hear more about that. Thanks goes to our partner organizing team and SCOG, which is the student organization helping us to organize this event for you. Without further ado, I wish you a fruitful debate. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. A couple of very interesting, important points indeed. We will tackle those in the course of uh, today's conference. Uh, but before we really start with that. Uh, two technicalities, as, as I said. The first one, we are excellent, 92%. You're already in. Well, I wanted to say that uh, we want to hear your voice. I know that uh, sometimes it is a problem uh, to get the first person speak. Uh, so we offer you unique, unique opportunity when it comes to this conference or conference series. It is unique. Otherwise, you are probably familiar with this tool. Uh, you can go to Slido, uh, slido.com, hashtag sharing, that's the password. You get into our own platform, if you will, sharing platform. There's a, a poll question, more or less uh, something that we want you to have as a warm up. So please participate. Uh, let us know whether you actually experienced the disruptive force of sharing economy already, no matter whether as a user or a provider of the service. And at the same time, the same platform, same page, 
you can use it to actually post questions. Uh, I will be collecting them as our guest of honors will speak and then ask either or or at least the best of them. That's one. Two, one more time, thanks to our partners, namely Price Waterhouse Coopers, PWC, and media partners, Investiční web, Radio Z, Info CZ, a Trade News. Thanks to them, we are not only live tweeting today's conference, it's at Investiční web, but we're also live streaming, and uh, the address should be available any minute at Investiční web, and I will try to put it on the screen very soon. Now, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome our speakers on the pa first panel, distinguished speakers, Chantal Ambo of BlaBlaCar. She will address the issue of sharing economy vis-a-vis, -vis, or in connection with automotive, Pavla Zizalova, PricewaterhouseCoopers, PwC Czechia, uh, she will talk about sharing more generally. Josef already mentioned uh, PVC, PwC very thorough study, so Pavla will be drawing on that in particular. And last but not least, Philip Google uh, of University of Freiburg, and he will address uh, certain threats or at least challenges, problems connected to the disruptive force or sharing economy as such. Chantal, the floor is yours. Thank you, Roman, for the kind invitation. Uh, thank you, Dean, for welcoming me to the University of Prague. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here today. I am Chantal Ambord. I'm leading international business development at BlaBlaCar. And today I will talk to you about the future of mobility, how mobility is getting disrupted. And if we talk about the future of mobility, one must talk about the future of cars. As cars are still the most used transportation mode today. Many of you will know that the first car that came to circulation was towards the end of the 19th century. And the first mass-produced car has been the Model T, produced by the very famous Henry Ford. This not only created an industry which is today worth more than a trillion euros, it also empowered us, the individual, to move freely and fast everywhere. We have built cities around cars. We have built amazing networks of roads which are connecting different cities, which are connecting countries, which are also connecting us to very remote places. Today, cars are the second largest investment that we do at individual level after buying a house. It's not only a very important sector, the automotive one of today's economy, but it is also one that over the course of the last 100 years has not uh, evolved as much as we could think of. In fact, cars today are still underutilized, time-consuming, dangerous and polluting. We spend about 20% of our average income on cars. And we keep them parked for 96% of time. Actually, on average, we are using cars only 4% of time, meaning one hour per day. And the striking fact is when you use this car, we are not using it to its full potential. The average occupancy rate in Europe of a car is 1.7 people, meaning that if you're driving and you're looking around you, you will notice that most people, 
most cars have only one person inside, and that person is the driver. Now, if we take this one hour per day, which is a spend of car, and you multiply it on an annual basis by the numbers of cars in circulation and by the occupancy rate, you get to something around 600 billion hours. You get somehow to the same calculation if you look at the 16 trillion miles, uh, uh, kilometers, sorry, that are um, driven every year, and you multiply this by the average speed. Now, talking about 600 billion hours, to me it just sounds like a very large number. In a year there are about 8,700 hours, means that we are talking that collectively we spend 68 million years in a car on a yearly basis. If you try to give it a value terms and you think that around the globe uh, an average, uh, uh, the average income of a person owning a car can be around 10 euros, then it's 60 trillion euros worth of value spent on people just sitting in a car. I believe that this car could be much better, this time could be much better utilized. Not only driving and staying on cars is time consuming, it is also dangerous. Car accidents account for the first, uh, death, the first cause of death for people between the age of 15 and 29. There are 1.3 million people dying every year on car accidents. And the majority of car accidents are actually due to human error, are due to people drinking alcohol, are due to people falling asleep on cars or people driving too fast. Last but not least, cars are extremely polluting. 45% of global oil demand comes from the car industry. They are one of the contributors of global warming and they are also making the air in large metropolitan area very bad. If I were to explain that to a kid, he probably would be looking at me and asking me, what are you doing? And in fact, I'm asking you, what are we doing? Well, one of the reasons why we're still using cars is because roads are the most dense transport network existing today. It connects us everywhere. Luckily today, we live in the age of uh, digital technologies. We need in the days of the internet. And this can dramatically change the way that vehicles are used today. Our goal is to move from a highly inefficient uh, mobility ecosystem into a shared, affordable, convenient, safe and green environment. How are we going to get there? Well, there are three major innovations that are today happening in the market. The first one is around the sharing economy. The second one is around the electrification of vehicles. And the third one is about the birth of autonomous cars. Now, if you take those on a single basis, they are all very powerful and very impactful innovation. But it's when you combine these three innovation that you start creating economies of scales. The sharing economy can make electric car much more cost effective by using more a vehicle, more hours per day. And if you're using more hours per day, then the payback period actually gets reduced. Autonomous vehicle can also make the time that one would have to spend in charges an electric vehicle much more efficient as the car can drive itself to the next, um, to the next station and, and get charged without a human having to spend time on it. So there are plenty of efficiencies that we can create around these three trends and when we will see them combine, it's where the real disruption will take place. Only the car in large metropolitan area has become obsolete. 
There are so many ways to move around from public infrastructure, including buses and tube stations, to new sharing economy services, such as car sharing, bike sharing. We have taxis, we have on-demand services. There is actually no reason why we should spend a lot of money trying to park a car in the city center or trying to move it in a very trafficked area when you have at your disposal any type of solution at your fingerprint. Mobile applications have made the use of transportation in city centers so much easier. You can find the solution which is better for you at a better price or that drives you to the destination at a faster pace. The situation, however, is very different for people that are looking to travel long distance journeys. 76% of trips city to city between 100 and 800 kilometers are still done by cars. The reason is what we said at the beginning, roads are the most dense transportation network existing today. There are so many distances that you can cover with rail and so many flights that you can take from a city to the other. But a country has so many different locations, some which are not as well connected with public infrastructure. The good thing is that if cars are still needed and roads are going to be still the transport network which is going to allow us to be mobile, we can use cars in a much more effective way. The sharing economy and so blah blah car is allowing people to carpool. And so instead of people having to drive alone in the car, they can reduce the cost of driving by allowing other people going to the same direction to jump on board and share the cost of the journey. On the other hand, we are giving access to passengers to the most uh, affordable, friendly and direct travel solution existing today, the car. We talked about sharing economy. Let's see how this is impacting the automobile industry. If you ask a traditional player how is he the industry, it will tell you there are 90 million cars which are sold every year at an average price of 16,000 euros. That makes it an economic opportunity of 1.4 trillion or 2% of global GDP. If you ask sharing economy expert and disruptors, they will see it very differently. They will tell you that there are 16 trillion kilometers driven with cars every year at an average price of 50 cents per kilometer and that makes it a 8 trillion dollar market opportunity or six times larger than what we call today the automotive industry. This is just part of the game. If the sharing economy is about to revolutionize how we move, there are going to be a lot of changes in the environment and the ecosystem. If cities are going to replace car by sharing economy services and will allow cars to be utilized more, there will be less of a need of parking spaces as we know it today. There are going to be entire areas that can actually be rebuilt and reconstructed and make it much more friendly for people to move around. We can create new parks, new spaces where people can meet and have good time inside a city. At the same time, if autonomous vehicles are going to put to market, we can go back to the 600 billion hours that you talked about before and we can make those at use. We can work, we can have entertainment in cars and we can decide what activities we want to make out of the time that we will be traveling. That is the reason why many people today are actually interested about this industry. It is not anymore an industry which is uh, run by automotive players, but there are some of the largest internet companies such as Google, Apple, Amazon, and uh, some of the new 
sharing economy players and ride sharing and carpooling services such as ourselves, BlaBlaCar, or companies such as Uber, Lyft, that are trying to revolutionize this space, either alone or in partnership one with the other. Lyft, as you probably have seen, has partnered with one of the big automotive players to bring autonomous shared vehicle to market. They are saying that they will do in the, slow in the next five years. We have partnered with leasing companies such as ALD and we have partnered with Opel in order to bring car as an access, as a, as a service. And so moving from ownership to access, paying a monthly fee which allows you to have everything included from insurance to maintenance and using the car. We don't know if it's going to be a couple of players which are going to be governing this new industry or if it will be many operating in different countries and from different perspectives. What we know is that the economy is big enough and that this whole improvement of the mobility service will make people even more incentivized to travel more. And we want to make mobility a much greener, friendly, affordable and safer travel solution. That's our goal at the car, so please join the ride and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chantal. Now, Pablo Vigilava of PricewaterhouseCoopers PwC. Just before Pablo takes the floor, uh, please be advised there's a first question posed via Slido. If you feel like there is something pressing, something you don't want to forget, and you might because we have two more presentations, use Slido to pose questions. Otherwise, of course, we have 45 minutes Q&A. You're more than welcome to jump in without using technologies. We can still talk to each other, of course, face to face. Pablo. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, Chantal already mentioned some numbers about the sharing economy and I would like to share some more numbers with you from our recent studies on the outlook of uh, the sharing economy in the next 10 years. But before I go more into detail, let me start with a short introductory video to one of our studies. You've surely heard about the major disruption that's happening across automotive, hospitality, retail, entertainment and media, and technology landscapes. It goes by many names, collaborative consumption, access over ownership, the on-demand or peer-to-peer -peer economy, and most commonly, the sharing economy. Whatever the label, it's a booming business. Already, the so-called sharing economy is upending business models across the globe, driving companies and consumers to rethink the use of underutilized assets. Uber operates in 250 cities worldwide. Airbnb has listings in more than 190 countries. Spotify pipes music to nearly 40 million users globally. Our survey showed that 44% of U.S. adults are familiar with the sharing economy. And the more familiar they are with these services, the more excited they feel. Nearly one in five adults say they have participated in the sharing economy as a consumer. 7% say they have participated as a provider. Collectively, these business models are changing the way consumers think about value, assessing the impact of goods and services on their wallet, their time, and the planet. The most compelling benefits are better affordability, 86% agree, and greater convenience, 83% agree. Plus, nearly three in four consumers say it's better for the environment. But while there's momentum and optimism, there are unresolved concerns. 73% of adults say they worry that the quality of sharing economy experiences will be inconsistent. And while 89% say that the sharing economy is based on trust between providers and users, 69% say they are concerned about putting their trust in these types of services. Yet so far, these concerns appear to be speed bumps, not barriers. And traditional players should take note. 
Companies must recognize changes in consumer purchase behaviors and adapt their market strategy accordingly. Likewise, companies will want to examine their own assets and overhead, identifying underutilized resources that could be tapped as a potential new revenue stream. A world of collaborative opportunities is opening up as more consumers shift from ownership to access. The question is, who will capitalize most effectively? For more about how your business can succeed in the sharing economy, visit pwc.com slash CIS. So to sum up this uh, short video, you've heard several names uh, which are given to this phenomenon. Even we've used two different names in our studies, the sharing economy or the collaborative economy. You may have heard uh, people talk about peer-to-peer -peer, peer economy, on-demand economy, but no matter how you name it, the sharing economy is going very big and very fast. But how big and how fast, it's uh, what our projections are about. From the global perspective, we expect that the revenues from uh, the sharing economy will grow from uh, the current around 15 billion US dollars up to 335 US billion US dollars in 10 years by 2025. So this is uh, 20 times more in just 10 years. When, we, when you look at Europe, the picture is very similar. We expect that uh, the revenues from the sharing economy, from the five key sectors of the sharing economy that we analyzed, will grow from approximately 4 billion euros uh, from uh, 2015 up to 83 billion euros by 2025. That means that the sharing economy revenues will grow at roughly 35% per year around 10 times faster than the wider economy as a whole, which we estimate to grow on average 3% per year. You see that the potential is relatively big. The sharing economy has already grown quite fast in the last few years. There was a strong growth already in 2013, accelerating in 2015 as large platforms invested significantly in their European operations. We expect that uh, the growth will continue throughout this year, even though it will be probably slower than in the previous years. We expect that uh, the revenues will grow by 60% this year, which is, as you can see, a bit lower than in the previous years, but it will still be outperforming most of the other sectors of the economy. But what are the key sectors behind this growth in, uh, when it comes to the sharing economy? We've analyzed five key sectors and uh, we expect that four of these sectors will facilitate over 100 billion euros of transactions annually with only the on-demand professional services lagging a bit behind. What will be the structure of the sharing economy uh, in 2025? It will change just slightly compared to what's the structure today. The peer-to-peer -peer transportation uh, will remain Europe's biggest sharing economy sector, accounting for over 40% of total revenues. There will be change on the second and on the third place because the on-demand household services will become probably the fastest growing sharing sector, growing by approximately 50% every year and overcoming the peer-to-peer -peer accommodation and becoming the second largest market of the sharing economy in Europe by 2025 and the peer-to-peer -peer accommodation dropping to the third place. These are the key numbers which are definitely interesting and show the potential of the sharing economy, but we expect that there will be other changes of the character of the sharing economy, not just 
that it will grow, but it will change its structure and the character. And I would like to share three trends we predict that will shape the future of the sharing economy after 2017. Nowadays, when we talk about the sharing economy, we usually mention Uber, Airbnb. It means transportation, accommodation, but we expect that this innovation will penetrate other established sec sectors as well, and probably very soon, sectors such as healthcare or retail. We've already come across a medical equipment sharing platform across the Atlantic, and I think that it's only a matter of time when it comes also to Europe and when we'll see such platforms here. The same applies for high-value high added services, such as, for example, legal services, which may be surprised maybe by this innovation by platforms such as Lawyers on Demand, which are already offering services on, uh, on the market. The second trend is uh, we call it silver surfing of the sharing economy. Up to today, the digital natives or the early adopters have been the key driver of the sharing economy, but we expect that this may change and the silver surfers, the over 50s, could be the key driver for the next phase of the sharing economy. And they are already one of the fastest growing user group for many of the platforms. Third trend I'd like to mention is that even corporates will probably become platforms themselves in order to uh, tap into this new innovation, disruption, and into uh, the new source of talent. And we have one example even in our own business, in the uh, US advisory business uh, service, where we piloted the talent exchange project. In our studies, we were also interested in why the sharing economy is such, such a phenomena, why, it, why people are attracted to it, What's, uh, what are the key attractive points behind that. And in order to understand it better, we interviewed more than 1,000 US consumers back in 2015 in about 25 minute survey and asked them about their experiences and opinions on the sharing economy. And I would like to share with you some of the key results of this consumer intelligence survey. The sharing economy is about experience and about emotions, which is what consumers are more and more interested in. According to our data, 43% of consumers agree that owing today feels like a burden. And the sharing economy has the advantage that it actually alleviates this burden. It alleviates the burden of cost of ownership, of maintenance, of choice, or lack of thereof, and countless other variables. This is particularly attractive for younger people According to other study, for, for example, adults ages 18 to 24 are nearly twice as likely as those ages 25 and older to say that excess is the new ownership, which was already mentioned by Chantal. Why? Basically because I don't need a drill. What I need is a hole in the wall. If you want to understand the sharing economy, we need to understand that trust is the key ingredient behind it. Trust is something that uh, enables us to feel reassured when we are staying in a stranger's home or when we are hitching a ride from someone we've never met before. But maybe surprisingly, the fundamental trust in peers, according to our information hasn't changed really over the years. 
what has changed is the, is the faith in the aggregate, which means people trust word of mouth. People trust recommendations from their friends, from their family, above all other forms of advertising. So again, some numbers from our survey. 64% of consumers say that in the sharing economy, peer regulation is more important for them than government, regu uh, government regulation. And 69% of consumers say that they will not trust the sharing economy provider until they are recommended by someone they trust. Unfortunately, we don't have such a consumer survey uh, for European countries, but uh, there was ING International Survey on the Sharing Economy prepared in, at the same time as our survey in the US, so it's a good source to compare the results. And I have some comparison for you. When it comes to participation in the sharing economy in Europe, you can see that it's a bit weaker than in the US. The ING survey found that uh, over 9% of US consumers participated in the sharing economy, while in Europe the number is around 5%. Interestingly, in our study, which we did in the same year, we found out that 19% of US consumers participated already in the sharing economy. So maybe the number is higher for Europe as well. And the truth is that it's changing maybe every, every minute. What's also interesting is that uh, our study as well as the ING study show that the willingness to share assets uh, with others is significantly higher in uh, other regions, regions other than US and Europe, for instance, in Latin America or in Asia, where the willingness to share assets with others is almost 80%, while in the US or in North America, it's around 50%. And what are the key reasons why people participate in the sharing economy in Europe compared to our study? It's actually more or less very similar. The key driver is our cost-saving considerations which is the key factor behind the participation in, uh, most of, in most of the member states of the European Union. The second key reason why people are participating in the sharing economy is because it, it, it's an opportunity to earn extra money. And the third reason, which is interesting uh, for myself, is because it is good for the environment. In our US consumer study, it was uh, even 75% who said that the reason that it is good for the environment is why they have participated in the sharing economy. To sum up, if the sharing economy has proven anything, it's that the business models cannot be taken for granted. And today, disruptors can be easily disrupted tomorrow. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. A very interesting presentation indeed, Pablo. Thank you. And last but not least, Philip. We've been fairly optimistic throughout the first two presentations, ladies. Thank you for that. So, a rather skeptical voice from Switzerland. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, Director Deldin, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Thanks for inviting me for this presentation. So, I come from the University of Fribourg. I'm head of the Center of Competitiveness. Uh, our activities are on competition, market policies, as well as competition. I will talk about challenges, but now I have another challenge because uh, following Chantal and Pavla, it's not easy. They have colorful presentation, video, 
and now is coming the boring economics professor with black and white slides. I hope you will, uh, in fact, be indulgent for, uh, with me. In fact, uh, I will try to start by the start, in fact, because we are talking about sharing economy, but at the, what does it mean? And what the economics of sharing economy, what are the main advantages and also these advantages. So that means I will try to be as uh, neutral as possible. In fact, uh, sharing economy is not a monster, is an economic system. We have to admit that is a new economic system related to the new industrial revolution called 4.0. And uh, as the two other presentation, I've already given uh, uh, examples. That means that we have private individuals. It's a new thing. It's private individuals that will share resources, services, goods, and they will use internet. That means, simple, they will use a sharing platform. Very easy to say, but now how to define the boundaries of this sharing economy uh, regarding those sharing platforms. In fact, the sharing platform are simple online platform, and group of individuals may be coordinated with each other, and are unable able to, in fact, to share resources, service, assets. They can share, they can rent, they can swap, they can exchange goods and services, sometimes for a fee, and sometimes for free, in exchange of other services, other goods. So, of course, we have also already example that of the main sectors uh, of the shared economy, like transportation, we have labor services, accommodation, open data, in the future, in many, many other sectors, from health services to retailing, etc. Of course, we know the main actors, like Uber, Airbnb, Task Rabbit in the United States to share all kinds of housing services, to do gardening, to fix a lamp, electricity, etc. Very important. For example, you, heard, you uh, learned that a few days ago, IKEA, in fact, uh, decided to acquire Task Rabbit because it's very important for this furniture company to be directly linked to the shared economy. And because if you go to IKEA, it's very nice, you know, on Saturday. But when you come back home, uh, you have to uh, assemble uh, everything yourself, and sometimes uh, you may face some disaster. So thanks to Task Rabbit, in fact, you will, in fact, overcome those challenges. Or even for data, open data, like you have, for example, in London, Lo London Data Store. Yeah, sorry, I want to yes, I forgot to that. So means also there are some weight of the sharing economy. I think Pavla already gave you some uh, example and some data. If I can quote again, in fact, PWC, what Pavla said, that if it was 15 billion in 2014, now um, the forecast for 2025, as Pavla already indicated, 335 billion. But if we assess all industries, in fact, that are affected by the sharing economy, they make around 50% of the GDP of developing countries. Of course, now the part of the sharing economy, in fact, is a point of the iceberg, but the growth is very important. Uh, also, I can just rely to Pavla data regarding the growth expected over the next few years. And just one example of a study, for example, that 9% of American independent workers provide services through the sharing economy. So it's quite very important. Of course, what are the main quality? And I thought you will be pleased that I talk also about the qualities or the advantages. Of course, facilitate exchanges. We can replace costly, boring intermediates. They allow directly two sides of the market, in fact, to be directly into contact. Of course, Many, many people now can be contacted directly. In fact, they can make a match. But what is very important for the sharing economy, that means is real-time, instantaneous match. You do not have to wait days and days or weeks uh, to get answers for companies, etc. And the sharing uh, platform also, they will provide you, of course, we will discuss also the advantages, but some trust. Because now you have the social network, you have the reviews, the testimonial. 
That means that even if you are alone home behind your computer, you are not alone. In fact, you can also assess, in fact, the different providers of the um, sharing economy. Of course, from a competition point of view, there are advantages. First, open competition to new players. If you have more competition, what do you have? You have perhaps more innovation, better good, better quality, better price. And it will challenge the existing monopoly, existing exclusive rights, in fact. That means that, in fact, they will decrease all ob many obstacles to entry the market, foster competition. And I can understand that the firms already in the market, they are not so happy to see that new entrants coming in. But it's a challenge, and it's a good challenge for competition, will foster innovation. Innovation in all types of sectors. Look at Uber. You can criticize Uber, but it was innovation. In many cities a few, day, a few years ago, it was a nightmare sometimes to find a taxi. You have to go in a specific location, in a specific street. You had to call a taxi until you get the phone call. They will tell you, yes, I'm coming in 20 minutes. After 45 minutes, they were not here. You miss your plane, etc., etc. No, through an application, innovation, through a new, uh, new way to do business, in fact, the taxi um, services market has been completely changed. And of course, if you have more competition, you should have more benefit for consumers, because in fact, larger choice, more choice, better quality, and we may expect also better price. Of course, we already discussed, there are disruption for the existing industries, for the existing incumbents, because now they are facing new risk. And particularly for the firms who are protected for many reasons, reg regulatory reasons or other reasons, and particularly for firms that produce product or services with low differentiations. Because then it's very difficult for them to keep a competitive advantages if you are more efficient firms coming through the sharing economy. Of course, until now, in fact, we know we have better examples regarding the two main sectors affected by the sharing economy, like transportation and lodging, for example. We have already some uh, few data. For example, uh, in uh, New York, the price of the taxi medallion, in fact, they fell by 23% between 2013 and 2015. There are another study showing that in Seattle, taxi income shrunk by 28% in two years. In lodging, another study showed that the income in Texas decreased by 0.35% for every 10% increase of listings in Airbnb. And there are also evidence that flats are taken out of the market and it's affect now the housing market, the real estate market, in fact. In fact, uh, now we have a competition with the existing firm, with the incumbent. Because now, of course, the newcomers, the new entrants, will gain market share, and that means decreasing the market share of the incumbent. Even though perhaps it's not true, because since we have the sharing economy, it's not only a pie, a cake with one size, and just companies have to fight to get the biggest part of the pie. Now, with the sharing economy, the pie is extended, so perhaps there are enough uh, uh, work, enough room, enough income for everybody. Of course, the, the incumbent cannot just uh, try to force or to convince the government to raise obstacles, in fact, to a trend that the consumer has decided to follow. That means that it's a trend, it's a reality, and we cannot just raise a regulatory barrier. They have to adapt. Adaptation. They can also be facilitators. They can also be players in the shared economy. They have collaborative agreements uh, with um, new entrants. They can try to be more uh, differentiation and not just to try to have homogeneous product and services, of course. And then the antitrust authorities should have an eye on that. They could be tempted to destroy competition, to raise barriers to entry, to violate anti antitrust law, in fact, to impede the new entrants to do business. But now, they have only one choice, to adapt, and very rapidly. Of course, there are some pitfalls now, because the main keyword is law, is regulations. Very difficult for regulation to be already enforced, 
without a, uh, a new economic phenomenon. Or else regulation has to follow some economic trends. And here, particularly, but they have to be as quick as possible, but you know, in most countries, a long process, new regulation takes a long time. I think my colleague in the next panel, I think is better expert than I, to discuss the regulatory and policy um, challenges. Of course, there are problems. For example, insurance. If you have an accident in an Uber car, will Uber insurance pay the cost or the drivers? Licensing. If you have a hotel, you have to have a license. But if you, for example, have a short-term rental, do you have also to have a license, yes or not? M many countries it is not yet. Or safety legislation. In many countries, for example, for the taxi drivers, they have to uh, have a maximum of uh, working hour per day. Perhaps for Uber, uh, perhaps they, those regulations no, do not exist. Another issue, of course, tax issues, payment of taxes. Because the share economy is also driven by big hub companies uh, governing the whole platforms. Companies try always to have fiscal optimization. Or some can, can underreport the earnings. Some local tax, for example, in tourism, hotels have to pay the visitor tax. But if you have an Airbnb flat or rooms, you do not pay those taxes. So that means it's a huge challenge. Challenge at the local level, regional level, national level, and, and so international level. Also, another problem is the labor market. The worker, the workers, in fact. Because most workers, depending on the sectors, may be independent contractors. That means they may experience income instability. Or they not get the benefits such as minimum wage, overtime pay, saving plan, sick leaves, etc. They have to educate themselves and uh, they have to maintain their working tools or capital investments themselves to pay the taxi, etc. So it means just to conclude, in fact, the sharing economy impact the market structure as well as the traditional paradigm of demand, supply and price, as you learn in your microeconomics courses. We have a physical market, digital market. But in fact, in the sharing economy, you have new ways to do business, new business model, new type of service, new organization of the value chain, new habit of the customer, new competitive firms uh, and forces, if I reflect to the five forces of Michael Porter. So that means that this sharing economy, in fact, poses all those multiple challenges, particularly now, currently, to our existing legal framework and to many incumbents player in the affected, impacted market. But what will be important? Because, of course, if there is more competition, nice. However, we need to have a fair playing field. That means that the new entrants, the incumbent, should have to comply with the same regulation. That means very important for competition to succeed, to have good results, means that the regulation should not create distortion of competition. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation, Philip. Now let's hear from you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me open with a warm-up round, if you will, Question to all of you, dear panelists, uh, and I will draw on at least some of the questions that have been posed uh, via our incredibly great platform. Uh, the old saying says, uh, definition is not everything, that, but everything includes definition. Uh, I mean, at least implicitly, you've tackled the issue of what is sharing economy to you, but let's be specific, and I'll, as I said, We'll quote some of the questions. Should we call a company a platform sharing, or is it a participant of a sharing economy when it's clearly profit oriented? Asks Andre. Uh, and he points out two different concepts couchsurfing or even blah blah, which uh, at its heart doesn't really have the hardcore profit making, and Uber or Airbnb that seems to at least some as a spin-off of traditional businesses. Uh, what would you say? Where is the, the line, the fine line, if there is, 
uh, in your eyes, in your brain, between, uh, let's say, entrepreneurship 2.0 or 4.0, meaning just using new technologies, modern technologies to do old things, and really something new, innovative, and uh, belonging into the share sharing economy bracket, if you will. Philip. Yeah. Difficult questions, but I will try. I think the first thing is when you say that we should have profit, you should have income, will depend on the value you propose to your customers. Means that, in fact, it's very difficult to have a, a, a dividing line between the so called traditional enterprise in the traditional physical markets and the new enterprise in the digital uh, markets. Of course, perhaps in the traditional physical markets, it's easier, in fact, to define the profits because they have tangible goods or services to offer, they are price, cost, and we calculate the margin. Here, as you said, that perhaps when we have some sharing economy, it means that you, some customer, will get some value. However, not always, in fact, uh, related to a specific price. For some sectors, you always have the price, like Uber, etc. But when you share services, etc., the pricing perhaps is more difficult to measure because you can share a service or you can share your equipment for gardening and uh, next week they will share you know, services to take care of the kids, of the dogs, I don't know from whom. So perhaps it will be outside you know, what you have learned in microeconomics co uh, courses with a demand offer a supply and a, a, a price, in fact. However, I do not have a specific definition because, in fact, I'm sure that perhaps in 10 years ahead, the one, these questions will be obsolete because, you know, we will live completely in the digital economy and that means perhaps even the so-called traditional sectors will have moved, in fact, to the digital one. Thank you. Pablo, we'll ask for your take on the subject matter. Well, uh, I agree uh, with, uh, with you that uh, I think it's difficult to have a certain definition. It's uh, maybe similar to uh, the question of the regulations because now we have Uber, we have Airbnb. Okay, we might regulate now, now these two types of uh, services. But as I mentioned in my presentation, the new new sharing platforms, new ways of uh, offering uh, goods, offering values for customers is uh, appearing uh, every day. So I think that the definition would be definitely obsolete and not just in 10 years time, but maybe already next year. So I, I don't have a definition and I, I'm not looking for one. I think that uh, we need to, to stay open and wait or what, what will happen and what will come? Uh, one of the questions addresses the difference at its core, the difference between Uber and blah blah, and that's something that uh, I already mentioned in my first question, so let's uh, call it a follow-up. Uh, maybe on that particular example, the difference between do those, these two companies, can you uh, tell us, Chantal, what is and is not in your eyes sharing economy or how individual players differ within this bracket, within this segment. Thank you. So I would agree that is a naming question. Uh, we have, I have a very practical example for you, which is uh, what is BlaBlaCar and what is Uber or Lyft uh, or are they interested in what they call ride-sharing platform. And we have been calling ourselves a ride-sharing community. Uh, for a very long time and then you know you have also Uber and Lyft uh, and Get and other companies that came to market and also call themselves ride sharing so the first question we get always asked is how does it differentiate from Uber um, and, and the truth is that we started actually call ourselves carpooling to make sure that the differentiation was uh, clear um, in the sense that people on the car are actually not earning money uh, the system is made in a way that we know the price per kilometers that actually in most country the government sets, uh, saying that that's the price that it will cost you to drive a car. And we make sure that the driver, when it shares this cost uh, with other passengers going the same direction, is not going to make money, but it's just going to save on the total cost of driving. 
which is a very different phenomenon to what Uber provides, which is a service always for people to be able to be mobile, but that makes drivers actually earning money and doing it as a part-time or full-time profession. Um, so to conclude, I think that yeah, sharing economy and, and what is it, what does it stand for, is it a non-profit, is it a for-profit, uh, I think that we should be focusing on what it means and I think it means value creation and so whatever it offers, whatever individuals can offer that provides value to society and that consumers accept as bringing value are kind of part of this new sharing economy or um, you know, however you want to call service and, and I think that uh, that's the most important thing. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, of course you can jump in, meaning you don't have to use the digital platform only uh, if you have something on your mind, uh, something that should be heard, uh, please raise your hand if you don't want to play with uh, the electronic gadgets we all have and love. Now, Philip, you mentioned, okay, thank you, sorry about it. Can we get a microphone all the way back to the gentleman? We should have a third one here, but sure. Do we have a third microphone here? No? All right, then we'll share. Sharing economy in practice. Yes. Matt, uh, good evening, um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bo Chap. I work uh, over the, across the street in the freight union house. So um, my question is, um, you talk about sharing as if it's something uh, neutral, as well as uh, you talk about platforms as, uh, as a sort of a neutral ground, neutral environment, which is not. Uh, the platforms are companies who are owned by somebody, by shareholders, and they are for-profit business. So my question is, what role of, uh, of the platforms, of the owners of the business, do you see within the so-called uh, sharing economy? So it might be considered a follow-up to the follow-up. Uh, platforms and uh, their impact on consumers, on society in more general terms, because uh, it would be a very narrow definition to call us only consumers, and economy as such. And maybe one question that is uh, connected, and I think it's from you. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, data privacy, you know, these kinds of things that obviously when it comes to digital economy and especially platforms are highly sensitive and relevant. Pavla, let's start with you this time around. Well, what's the impact of the platforms on the consumers? This was maybe the first uh, question. I think it's a uh, for many people, it's changing the the way they they, for example, uh, they they work, they they commute, they they live, they use uh, use their assets. If I come back to uh, the example I gave from uh, our own company, from uh, PwC US Advisory firm, uh, with our pilot talent program platform, it offers a new way how people can actually work with PwC on PwC projects without becoming our employees. They can stay independent, they can stay flexible, they can uh, choose whether they are interested in working on a project or not. And uh, for us, the benefit is that we can actually tap into specific talent, into specific um, experts, uh, which we won't need all the time, 100%, but we can offer them an interesting job on a, on a project. So these are the opportunities that the sharing economy and the, the platforms offers. When it comes to the challenges, as for example, the, the privacy, that's that's an important issue, but not just uh, in, uh, in terms of sharing economy. You have uh, Google, Apple and all other big companies, Facebook, social, social networks, which are all gathering data on what we are doing and sometimes 
I'm surprised that I think that uh, my phone knows more about me than, than actually myself. So I think this is not just related to, uh, to the sharing economy. It is something we need to be aware of, not just on the, let's say, more aggregate level, but uh, every, every individual should, should be aware of that and uh, should be aware that they are sharing some individual information, individual data with all these, all these networks and, uh, and platforms. And of course there, there is a risk, but uh, I don't have answer what, what the solution should be, should be but uh, definitely this is a challenge. It's going to be a, a bit of a game of, uh, of thrones, if you will. I'll try to be fair. Thank you. Uh, Shanta, let's look at Blabla in particular. Uh, where do you see your role? Do you, for instance, think about the societal impact, impact on certain uh, professions as a part of your strategy, as a part of the discussion that uh, is ongoing in every firm, essentially? Is it something you take into account or consider? And when it comes to data, uh, what's your policy? Um. Yes, so a couple of questions. First, I wanted to answer the gentleman in saying um, that yes, platforms that provide sharing economy services are business platforms, so they are actually businesses, and uh, yes, they do make money, and that's how you actually become uh, a sustainable business itself, and their business should allow people to uh, share the resources in whatever form or sector uh, with others, and so it's a business that unlocks potential of the communities. Um, in terms of how we see competition, um, I guess that in terms of direct competition, there is actually few people that uh, have managed, there is a few platforms which are out there in the market. Nobody has managed to create uh, the community at which we operate today. We actually have 50 million members spread across 22 countries, so it's, uh, it's quite sizable. And it's not easy to, to bring this community to life and so to have uh, uh, this uh, large amount of people that are sharing trips together because you actually have to create a lot of trust and trust takes time to scale. Um, we obviously take into account uh, uh, other service providers that are operating in long distance transportation. I do believe that what sharing economy services are bringing to market is uh, uh, is a lot in the sense that they increasing the size of a certain sector. So if you think about mobility, I believe that all the players in the sharing economy mobility space are actually allowing people to move more. So the market opportunity is actually, as a result, much bigger than it used to be. Um, so you're partly obviously disrupting the one that are currently using services by uh, providing a maybe cheaper or better or more efficient option of travel or of uh, uh, accommodation. But at the same time, you are increasing the number of people that are searching for such a services. And in our particular case, uh, I would say that obviously there are trains and there are buses uh, which are operating in countries and are offering long distance transportation services. But I said at the beginning, uh, the, 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 and we have a map actually that shows uh, uh, in a given month of time, all the trips that are going around uh, uh, everywhere we operate. And it's impressive because there is so many destinations and so many places that people need to go. And trips are not only between two big cities, they can be between one uh, big city and a small countryside village uh, in a far away 200, 300 kilometers uh, away place. And that, that, that segment is actually not served by the bus, it's not served by the train, but it's only served by Babacar. Then there is obviously more competition in segments where there is a lot of volumes, and so I would say more on the city to city segment. And there it's the choice of the consumer to decide whether he prefers to travel with car, with buses, with train, whether he prefers to have a faster way of travel and take a high speed train that maybe is more expensive, or to travel on Babacar and, uh, and save on the cost of the journey and have. Uh, a fun experience by meeting new people inside inside the car and uh, and sharing the journey with others. Thank you. 
Uh, you raised two important, uh, I would say, uh, or dare to say, even key issues: regulation and trust. We will get back to those, but Philip, please. Yeah. I think you raise a very important questions and you put your finger, in fact, on the right point. Of course, I can, in fact, share what has been done. The, we are not in philanthropy. The platform, as I said in my presentation, are an economic system with supply, demand, and price, and offer a service to do business to do profit. However, in fact, is the so-called network effect. If you have a large platform with a lot of members, all people would like to be member of the biggest platform, in fact. More members they have, more value they offer to the potential customers, and the customers are even more uh, ready to pay even a higher price, in fact, to belong to those platforms. It's like you have Facebook. If I organize a new social web network with my three colleagues, and I said, my ass is free, but now, Facebook, you have to pay five euros per month. Are you going to share our four platform or four members? No. You said, I prefer to be on a Facebook, even if you have to pay. In fact, it's a so-called network effect, but as you said, the customer decides that. And we cannot go, in fact, on, a, on the other way. However, the problem with those network effects, that they may build, in fact, dominant position that those big platforms like Google, Apple, Amazon, Amazon for retail, etc., may be such powerful and may have dominant position on the market. And of course, until now we said the sharing economy is nice because it's more competition. But one of the other challenge for the regulation, particularly antitrust regulation, is to avoid that you have these big, what they call hub companies, in fact, be able to dominate the market and once they dominate the market, they only want to increase their profits, and to increase their profit, they will decrease competition. Uh, let me just ask a follow-up question, uh, Philip. That's uh, essentially something you tackled already in your presentation. You know, you said there is no way back, and my immediate uh, thought was, well, we have almost monopolies in certain sectors at the moment, isn't it something that we might experience again, that the same like oil or cars, uh, we're going to get some key players that will, hand in hand with regulators obviously, try to squeeze the rest out or at least keep them at the bottom? I think also a good question. It was also what I said previously, to be, uh, to be careful that there are not big companies, in fact conglomerate, that they will try to, to dominate the market. But one thing I'm sure we cannot go back. And if you look at the history uh, of the industries, now we are talking about sharing economy, that the incumbent firm, you know, they are suddenly facing challenges. But if you look back, even 20 years back, in fact, we have already signals that the sharing economics was there and was challenging, in fact, the incumbent. Look at the airline. 20 years ago, in fact, if you wanted to buy an airline ticket, you had to go to a travel agency. It was a big deal. Now, with low-cost companies, in fact, what they have done, they have used internet. In fact, they were one of, the, one of the first industries where, in fact, companies have used internet to challenge, in fact, the incumbent, it was more or less the national carriers. So it gave, in fact, a, a first signal to the economics players that with internet, in fact, will change everything. And everything will be changed. It's not the company who can force the customer to change their, their habits. The customer, in fact, will do it, will decide it. And for airlines, the customer are playing a part of the value chain. And it's what is coming now with the so-called sharing economy. But it, the sharing economy uh, has not exist, is not existing for just two or three years, in fact. We had already some signal many years ago. Still, regulators can and will play a significant role. So let's tackle the issue of regulation. Chantal, we've already talked about it briefly before the conference. From your perspective, and the same question will be posed to you later on, Pavla uh, and Philip, uh, what is the way forward? Should we have lighter regulation for sharing economy, tougher regulation for whatever reason? for the traditional participants? Should we merge the two? Or how do solve the issue not only of 
cabby drivers versus Uber, something very relevant and, and timely, but generally new and old, uh, if I may say so, uh, in this oversimplified manner. Well, I think that the, the, the sharing economy is here. Uh, there is this new industry and there are new players which are operating uh, in, uh, in various countries today and offering different type of services. Um, yes, it is true that uh, to, to kind of follow up, uh, uh, to start with, uh, there is a few that may kind of get to a kind of monopoly type of situation, but it's also true that there can be many players uh, in the same segment. If you look at the uh, taxi uh, ride hailing market in Russia, for example, you have, well, you have Yandex Taxi, you have Get, um, you have uh, Uber, which was uh, still operating before the partnership with Yandex alone, uh, and others which were kind of a significant uh, part of the, the market share. So I think that it is possible to disrupt. You would say that everyone is on Facebook and so everyone uh, uses Messenger, yes, but you know, WhatsApp managed to have uh, a huge number of, of users that came uh, to use a very simple, actually, messaging platform in a very short period of time, and then Snapchat, and then again, and then again. So I think that it's just probably a different type of competitions and different mode of player. Um, how regulators can adapt to that? Well, I guess from a regulator's perspective, it's also challenging because uh, these changes are happening faster than they have ever done. Normally, certain industries were created and then were, you know, kind of getting established and staying for a long uh, periods of time. Now, the revolution or evolution of certain industries happening at such a pace, which is challenging for regulators to stay behind it. Uh, said that, I believe that there is obviously needs to adjust uh, regulations to make sure that they embrace uh, these new economy services because. At the end of the day, those new sharing economy services, they provide jobs. Um, they increase the market opportunity of certain industry and they make consumers happy because uh, we are talking about them because people use it. If people use it, it means that there is a need um, and a potential for that market. So how they can react to those new services? Well, I don't think that there is one uh, uh, size fit all. I think that there is different industry with different dynamics, with different problematics, those being data, um, being uh, transportation, being licenses, being taxes. I think it really depends on the sector, uh, on the country, should be dealt on a, at a country level um, and, uh, and, and hopefully should kind of embrace all players together and, and trying to find a solution. There will be never a solution which is perfect for everyone there will be a need for compromises, uh, but there is a need for adaptation, and that needs to happen very fast. I promised a local content, so uh, a follow-up. Sorry, sorry, Philip. Uh, one more question. Uh, and at uh, Chantal, uh, somebody from the audience asks, "How did blah blah enter the Czech market?" And obviously, they're asking about regulation. How tough was it, uh, for instance, compared to other countries? Because sometimes we have a feeling that we're uh, uh, over bureaucratized unnecessarily. <laughs> so we enter new markets in, uh, in different ways. Sometimes we enter new market by acquiring existing companies which are operating in the same or similar segment and sometimes we build a new team from scratch. Um, on, uh, in, uh, in Czech Republic we actually went through the acquisition route. So we actually have acquired a company in 2015 and we have launched uh, uh, the country through it. The truth is that for what we do, uh, normally we are always operating on more or less a great zone, in the sense that nobody has done that before, hence there is no regulation really talks about what we do. Um, our approach to the market is that uh, we try to work with regulators when there are questions in uh, make them actually understand what we do, because it starts with understanding the market. And I said there is so many changes which are happening in the economy at the same time that for regulators is different to is difficult to actually understand the difference between Uber or BlaBlaCar, Airbnb, uh, you know, marketplaces, uh, um, etc. And so we, we try really to educate government in understanding that we are providing a tool that doesn't allow individuals to make money, but just to save money on the journey and makes uh, mobility better. And normally by working with regulators, we actually come to the conclusion that either 
we can continue to operate in the way we do or there are changes and improvements in the regulations so that uh, um, we can uh, actually operate in a completely compliant way. Um, we obviously had cases where our business model was challenged, uh, but so far we were um, able to explain this in a, in a, in a very good way. And uh, so far, there's been uh, no questions about us uh, having to close our services in any of the countries in which we operate. Philip, uh, what is your take on, uh, on <laughs> regulation? regulation? More yes. or less, more, more regulation. Like, Prop, maybe, uh, maybe one concrete question again uh, coming for, uh, through Slido. Nowadays, speaking of Airbnb in big cities, many people claim that uh, it is pushing local citizens out of the city centers. It's pricing them out making living in these areas un unavailable or impossible. And we have ghost streets as a result. Should, at that point, regulators jump in? Is it a, one of the cases that, or examples of where regulation is still needed, and maybe more so because of platforms yeah. or these yeah. sharing companies? <laughs> yeah, but I was wondering if that we have to have adaptation, regulatory reform, and if the regulatory reform will create a fair playing field between the traditional players and the new entrance players. Perhaps in such a way that Airbnb won't be so profitable compared to the rental of an apartment of a long period, you know. Because now perhaps there are some extra profit due to the fact that the companies can had some advantages due to the regulat regulatory loopholes. So that means could be an answer. That would be very difficult to have a law that to uh, oblige uh, private people who own a house, an apartment, that they cannot use or rent this apartment as they wish. I don't know if uh, in a country such a law could be passed, in fact. But coming to your question, should we have regulation for the new entrance, uh, regulation for the traditional economy, I think regulation should be industry-wide, in fact, not have such kind uh, of division. Of course, the regulation should foresee, in fact, as much as possible, in fact, uh, all cases that may be raised by the new situation due to the sharing economies. And of course, horizontal, industry-wide, and also to address vertical topics like safety regulations, uh, were, uh, labor and uh, worker rights regulation, etc. But I think it's another challenge. We have not discussed so far regulation. Should the regulation be uh, tackled, be adopted at the city level, regional level, or national level, or tax, uh, or even international level like EU level, it can be an, an issue that if every city wants to have its own regulation on taxi, own regulation or housing, or lodging, etc., could also create distortion of competition, a lot of a, a negative externalities among region, uh, cities in the same region or among region. So very difficult to tackle in fact, at which level, in fact, regulation should apply. And last but not least, the timing of the regulation. We have seen that so fast. It's very long time in most countries, in fact, we have democratic countries that needs to take time to uh, uh, adopt discuss, adopt, enforce a new legislation. Perhaps we have also to have very broad laws, that means because the law it's a long time to adopt a law, and perhaps to have more, it depends upon the country, the so-called guidelines, ordinance, you know, is how to apply specific item of the law, and they are more flexible. You can adapt them more easily than to adopt a, a new law, in fact. However, regulation is one thing, so you have to ad adopt regulation, you have to convince politicians, but politicians have to follow their citizens. And the whole afternoon, we, take, we talk about changes. And people do not like changes, you know, even if we are the, the, the creator of changes as customers. But uh, we do not like changes, and perhaps we do not like to have new regulation, in fact. Thank you. Uh, we will talk more about regulation uh, on our second panel, obviously. We have Kala here. He will tell us how it can be done. It can be, uh, you know, the, the legislators, politicians, uh, can actually at least somehow be up to date. Uh, we'll be more than happy to take some pointers and pass them on to Czech legislators. Uh, Pavla, what would you uh, recommend to the government, to uh, the bureaucratic apparatus, if you will, of the Czech Republic? 
how to deal with these issues and uh, you know let's forget about Uber versus uh, taxi drivers but generally sharing economy <laughs> what is the most important thing to do right now what would be the first step if you had a chance to actually dictate well m <laughs> the first uh, would be uh, we shouldn't fight them because we uh, we will maybe fight the the current problem but uh, tomorrow and or maybe next year another problem will uh, will arise. As I said at the end of my presentation, uh, the today's disruptors can be easily disrupted today. And I think that we cannot fight the disruption. We can fight it, but just for a certain time. But uh, we are probably going to lose, as the history has uh, already proven. So I would recommend them not to fight them, but try to cooperate with them. And when it comes to regulation, I think that, first of all, they should look at the existing regulation and see actually how it already applies to the sharing economy and to the new platforms, because there are a lot of regulations and uh, particularities which can be applied to them. We are just not used to think of the businesses uh, in this new way. We always think of the traditional businesses, but uh, okay, the, the sharing platforms are businesses. They are uh, profit-making companies. So we have regulation for such companies. So let's have a look what can be applied to them. So first of all, we should uh, focus on uh, requiring that they follow the existing regulation. Then when it comes to some adaptation, I think that it's important to look into the future and think that we need to regulate what is still to come and not think that we need to regulate the past because if we think of just the, the past cases then the, the regulation will be just a barrier and they will probably find a way around it we need to, to focus on what may come what are the challenges for future and here I think I would agree probably Philip that the regulation needs needs to be general. We the very specific regulations are going to become obsolete. You, yeah, because the the world is uh, changing very fast. It's uh, it's changing and we need to somehow make a general regulation which uh, will work in the next 5, 10, 20 years so that we don't, we don't need to come up with new regulation every, every year and so on. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for all your questions. Unfortunately, the time is almost up, so we will, we're going to not be able to go through them all. However, I will ask some of these relevant ones during the second panel. Now, the final lap, final round, uh, we have a very interesting take on shared economy. What do you think about shared refrigerators, where people left food, leave food, that they are not able to eat uh, fresh and, for instance, go on holidays? Uh, is that a possibility or is it one of the possible future faces of sharing economy? And now, uh, obviously, I'm asking you not to only, if you will, comment on uh, shared refrigerators, but generally, what does the future hold for us? Uh, traditional economy or economy as such, vis-a-vis -vis sharing economy, and what the sharing economy as such will look like in, let's say, 20. We were talking about 2025, that's the PwC reference point, and many people actually use it. So let's say 2025. I'll ask uh, Chantal to tell us something about blah blah in 2025. Maybe you can start with that. So first, it seems that someone in the audience has a new business idea, and uh, I would uh, suggest to actually try it. It seems that someone is passionate about food waste. I think food waste is actually uh, um, something that a lot of people are trying to tackle because it's just incredible, the inefficiency at which uh, we are eating and how much food is wasted in our houses, in restaurants, in bars, Expiring date, for example, don't really make sense because people have to put an expiring date on food, but it doesn't really represent when the food is going to expire. 
So there are people which are changing the way uh, we are putting expiry dates on food and uh, others which are just trying to recycle food in a much more efficient way from the ones which are going around with uh, camions and taking food on wasted food and restaurant and bringing it to people that don't have something to eat uh, to all kind of uh, innovation. So I believe it's a very hot industry, so whoever was in the audience and asked this question, you should look into it and, and try to come with, uh, with an innovative solution. When we talk about 2025, seven years from now, uh, the truth is, who knows? We have prediction and we see the direction in which we are moving. Uh, as I said, I think that the, the three big trends uh, which we are seeing in the mobility sector are around electrification, autonomous, and shared vehicles. Um, at Blablacar, we are continuously innovating. As I said, we, we have done a partnership. We started doing partnership with uh, the automotive sector in order to move into the direction of giving access to vehicles instead of uh, only getting people to buy vehicles and so uh, helping the, the, the revolution in that sense. Uh, but we also starting to provide additional services. We have uh, launched uh, a new service which, bought, which is called the Blabla Lines, which is focused on commuting, which is another very impor uh, important problem that we have in today's society. The way we commute to work is absolutely inefficient. If you look, live outside city center, there is a, in big metropolitan area a, a, a catastrophe of a, a, a huge amount of cars which are moving inside and outside the city. Again, most of the people are driving alone. If we manage to pull people together and stop using their cars, but actually having a few people inside a car that are going in the same direction, the same hour of the day and returning the same hour of the day, I think that we can create a lot of efficiency. Um, we are also working on insurance. Uh, insurance is something that, again, I think is, uh, is one of the industry as probably every actually single industry with the age of digitalization is getting disrupted. We're trying to make insurance smarter and, uh, and we have a new business line which is actually focused on insurance and the future of, uh, of insurance. Those are three uh, sectors that I can speak about that we're working on. There are, of course, many others. Uh, there is uh, so much coming from this space. So keep on watching us and you will discover some uh, new innovations. Yeah. Maybe uh, can you also address the threat? Because uh, one of the, not one, a couple of uh, questions are essentially aimed at downside of it all, if you will. Yes, I was preparing for the other type of questions, the advantages so I have to turn everything. In fact, the, 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 the threats, uh, very difficult to answer because, of course, um, the threats perhaps, uh, yes, I, am, I already mentioned the big threats, that means unfair competition, that means some sectors can be destroyed and uh, cannot be replaced. We have to be careful that the sharing economy is not destroying existing services. That means the company are going out of the market. And then, in fact, existing need cannot be supplied anymore. Could be a threat, in fact, in, 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 some, uh, in some sectors. But in fact, even though in my presentation, of course, I gave also some drawbacks of the share economy. However, I'm sure that, in fact, in the future, we'll have, in fact, a new response to existing needs. And we have a lot of needs of customers, of citizens that are not served now. In fact, and now, since we are entering in the sharing economies, I think you are more keen, in fact, to, uh, to consider, in fact, uh, uh, other ways, in fact, even to use our own equipment, even to use our own fridge to respond to your questions, etc. Of course, also challenges for the traditional companies. For example, uh, where I live, you have all the house, we have all gardening equipment. And I am using, you know, just to, to cut the grass only once every 10 days. Otherwise, in the garage. For all my neighbors, it's the same. And now, of course, talking about sharing economy, you can also have a blah, blah, gas, uh, uh, grass uh, cutting equipment, I don't know what. But we think that we are completely stupid, in fact, that in fact we haven't, in fact, thought about that. And sharing economy is also one advantage, sorry, is a better use of resources, more efficient use of resources, better allocation of resources, of course, if we, if we play the game.
Pablo, last but not least, what uh, does PwC or you in particular expect from 2025 vis-a-vis -vis sharing economy? Well, I think that we'll be, we will be surprised. <laughs> uh, maybe even uh, we in PwC, we will be surprised uh, maybe when uh, we compare in 2025 the reality with uh, our projections. But what I think the sharing economy will look like, uh, I think that the refrigerator is a great idea. And actually, I will come back to one of the numbers I mentioned in my presentation that 75% uh, of the consumers said that they participate in the sharing economy because it goods for the, it good, uh, it's good for the environment. And I think this is great about the sharing economy that it actually may help tackle several issues and not just the environmental issues but uh, for example social issue issues there are many social innovations which are based on the principles of sharing economy which help uh, certain uh, people or groups of people to tackle their uh, their problems to have access to equipment they couldn't afford to buy but they can share to services they couldn't afford to pay the full uh, full price. For example, I mentioned also the, the legal services, and this is the case when you have the, the sharing platform for legal services, even uh, people who couldn't afford to pay for a lawyer, for a traditional lawyer, can buy services. Uh, advice on uh, on such a platform which can actually help help them solve problem maybe even like a life problem uh, so I think that the sharing economy is helping to tackle a lot of issues there are a lot of threats and challenges uh, Philip mentioned several of them but uh, I would like to and positively that uh, I think that uh, the sharing economy is actually helping to solve a lot of issues which would stay otherwise unsolved. Thank you for the positive note. Uh, I, I see you, but unfortunately, really, the time is up. So uh, maybe uh, try the second panel. Uh, maybe it's going to be relevant. I just want to be fair. We have like 15 questions here. We're not going to have a chance to uh, to actually address. Once again, thank you for a positive note, Philip. Yeah. yeah I just would like to say that sharing economy is real time. So if you record it or response, please destroy them in two years ahead, because uh, what we said now will be completely obsolete. And no, we're gonna we're gonna play it in 15 years time, and we're gonna be laughing at ourselves. You know, it's always good to actually have this kind of a um, take on life, <laughs> especially now, as as you said, the pace of change is very very fast. Okay, thank you for positive note. Last but not least, uh, the second panel is going to be all about regulation policies, and uh, I'm afraid it's going to be less positive. Uh, or maybe Kale will actually make us at least smile, if not laugh. Ladies and gentlemen, Chantal Ambo, blah, blah, Clar. Thank you very much, Chantal. Philip Gugler, University of Freiburg. And last but not least, Pavla Zizalova, PWC. We have 20 minutes for whatever you need to do and in 20 minutes please come back we have another great lineup of speakers and of course again a chance for you to participate
the sharing economy of the concept. And now on the second panel, we will focus on uh, the regulatory framework, something we already mentioned, uh, or rather lack of it. In practice, it means that we will focus on something that should facil facilitate the potential of sharing economy and lessen the threat attached, and at the same time, B, if you will, it should address something, uh, it should address the reason why you were standing in lines in a traffic jam for many hours on Monday. Uh, as you might probably know, the Czech government uh, expert body is going to discuss the issue of sharing economy and uh, what to do about it uh, tomorrow, and our immodest aim is to come up with uh, at least some of the possible solutions to the subject matter, to the issue in question. Uh, we're having Jan Havlik here uh, from the Department of the European Affairs and Internal Market, uh, uh, the Minister of Industry and Trade here, so he'll be for sure more than happy to pass along our recommendations. Uh, hello, thank you. And I should mention that Jan actually uh, took over, if you will, or was willing to come uh, instead of Andrei Mali from the Office of the Government. He was supposed to be our speaker on this panel, uh, but got sick, so twice as much thanks, if you will. Uh, as I mentioned already in the course of the first panel, we're having also Kale Paling from Estonia, a member of Parliament. Uh, Kale was instrumental uh, in uh, the process of passing uh, of a law that regulates Uber and similar platforms, and we, me at least, uh, will be very interested in hearing the ups and downs of such a process. And last but not least, it is my great pleasure to welcome Mr. Hubert Gams, Director at Modernization of the Single Market, Director General for Internal Market, Industry, Entrepreneurship and Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises at the European Commission. Uh, maybe a, a, a small technical uh, pass along in Brussels that these are terrible. These titles, please spare us next time around. Let's try to shorten it, okay? That would be sharing in practice, me passing along. Uh, Hubert also came just for the purpose of this very conference, so again, same like Kale coming in the morning, flying out in the afternoon. Thank you very much for that indeed. Uh, given the pending case uh, in which European authorities will decide whether states can or should regulate Uber uh, and other platforms as they please without uh, paying too much attention, if you will, to European and other uh, legislation, I would ask Hubert to actually start. Uh, please share the Commission's perspective on sharing economy and related issues. Thank you, Roman. I can actually help you already as with these, I admittedly, admitted, difficult and long names. That's why every Directorate General in the European Commission has, an, has a short abbreviation and it stands there, DG Grow. The, my department is supposed to help the economy of the, in the European Union uh, to grow. I want to start by thanking for inviting me to this event, uh, in particular, of course, the University uh, of Economics here in Prague. Um, and I want actually to start by a, a story that I, I was inspired by the very interesting um, presentations in the first panel. Uh, and I decided I want to introduce you to my boss. My boss uh, is, Im is called Imfried. She is 58 years old and she is therefore one of the silver servers that Pavla mentioned uh, earlier today. You know? Around 20 years ago, Imfrid moved from Austria to, to Brussels and uh, with a small family, 
the family got uh, bigger, the cars that Imfrit and her husband were owning got also bigger, they ended up at the end with a seven-seater. And then, uh, two years ago, the youngest of their kids uh, moved out of the house. So Imfrit and her husband, husband decided, we sell the house in the suburbs, we move to a flat in the city center of Brussels, right on top of one of the currently hip restaurants in, in, in Brussels, and we sell our car. We get rid of our car. Uh, we become member in three uh, carpooling uh, companies. And uh, she told me more than once how relieved she is not to have to worry about uh, costs, about maintenance for the car, about parking, because also in Brussels, uh, parking your car is often a challenge. And I'm, I'm inspired uh, also by Imfrid. I wonder whether in eight, roughly eight years, when my time as a weekend taxi driver, my second job as a weekend taxi driver for my kids will supposedly end when they uh, leave house, the house, whether I will follow her example. But honestly now, I don't know, because who knows how the world will look in this area in eight years. It has been mentioned before, uh, this is a very fast moving, moving area. Um, it is driven by strong consumer interest. The sharing, or as we in the European Commission like to call it, the collaborative economy, it is developing very rapidly in many parts of the EU. And that's, it's only logical that the Commission takes a very keen interest in the collaborative economy. I firmly believe that much I'm, 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 I'm about to say about the future is that the collaborative economy creates new opportunities already now, and it is here to stay. There are estimates, figures that we have seen it, uh, we have heard them actually before, and I'm very happy that the ones that I have here correspond to the ones that we heard before, because otherwise I would have to explain, I guess, the difference. The revenues across the sectors reached 28 billion euros in 2015. There are calculations that around 200,000 jobs were created in the European Union, and the potential of the sharing economy is enormous. The potential, I have here a figure that my colleagues gave me, it's 570 billion euro in the EU, approximately 4% of the EU's GDP. Now, they didn't put me the year there, so at a certain moment, I will be right. I have also a special fact about Prague, because here we also have seen, not surprising, a very significant growth of the collaborative economy. And it can be seen, for example, in the area of the short-term rental accommodation. From 2014 to 2015, there was an increase of 82% in the number of listings for Prague, and there was a 122% increase in the number of guests via Airbnb. Prague is actually, I didn't know that before, the fourth most sought after city in Europe on Airbnb, only put into that place by London, Paris, and Rome. More than Vienna, I was thinking, to my surprise, but I understand it is beautiful here. In the Commission, we want, of course, to help new business models to grow and to let consumers take advantage. But of course, we have to also to take into account the challenges that the collaborative economy brings and make sure that this sector of the economy develop in a responsible and balanced way. That taxes are paid, that consumers are protected, and that social protection of workers is guaranteed. And this panel is called Going Beyond Policing. The Commission is aware of the challenges, but I hope you indulge with me that I would also like to mention some of the opportunities that we see are directly linked with the collaborative economy. First, opportunities for citizens as services users in terms of innovative new services and greater choice. More than half of the EU consumers are aware of the collaborative economy platforms or have used them and the numbers are growing and as the the survey in the beginning of the conference has shown here, of course, we are in an even further developed situation with over 90% of you having made uh, experiences. There are also opportunities for the citizens to become micro-entrepreneurs. 
offering services either occasionally or uh, professionally and therefore generating some additional income. Almost one third of those who have been on collaborative platforms have also provided a service on, at, for there at least once. And there are opportunities for traditional businesses in terms of new sales channels that are opened and access to new potential customers. And indeed, one of the trends that, is, that we see happening now is that more and more traditional service providers are moving into the world of collaborative services. So I think we will all be able to agree that the collaborative economy can make important contributions to innovation, entrepreneurship, and economic dynamism. But again, I personally also believe that the ultimate value that the collaborative economy will bring to our societies will very much depend on its balanced and re responsible development. If we want to promote the sustainable long-term development of the collaborative economy, we should not therefore ignore the challenges arising from its rapid development. We have to address these challenges and we have to do it together, otherwise we will not find the right solutions. Fact is that many of us working in public authorities are looking at how to deal with these same challenges, no matter if we work at local, regional, national or European level, and actually no matter where in the European Union. We are all asking ourselves how we can ensure that consumers are protected, taxes and social contributions are paid, and at the same time we can promote entrepreneurship and innovation. And I know many companies in this area, they are asking themselves exactly the same questions. This is why the, I believe it is so important to have conferences like this one, uh, where best practices can be shared among regulators, experts and stakeholders. And it is part of the job for my colleagues and me to go them, not only sometimes we organize conferences, but also to go them and to go out and learn a lot how, like, like it happens to me today. Because we need common answers to common issues. And this is actually what, what can make Europe strong. Because unfortunately, what we are seeing today is too often a fragmented approach with policies and regulation being very different, even when these challenges and when the issues are the same ones. We see an increased regulatory fragmentation within and between member states, restrictive laws imposed in some member states, and legal uncertainty on how EU rules apply. And legal uncertainty, every business will tell you, legal uncertainty is poison to, success, to, to doing successfully business. Ongoing reform of sector-specific legislation, for example, in the areas of short-term rentals accommodation and urban transport, may not be always fit for purpose and can hamper rather than promote the balanced development of the collaborative economy. I come now to the Commission's 2016 communication. Last year, we tried to make an important step to, to avoid this market fragmentation and to ensure this balanced development. And therefore, in, July, in June last year, the Commission adopted a communication and we wanted to provide legal guidance on how to apply the existing EU law to the collaborative economy and to offer policy recommendations for its de development not only for the market operators, but also for the public authorities at all levels, local, regional, and national. The reaction from member states was very positive, in particular because the Commission had said we will not make a proposal for regulation at EU level. We will uh, make, give guidance, but uh, no regulation at EU level. We, pro we decided against proposing additional EU, level, EU rules, specifically on the collaborative economy at this stage, because actually there are many rules that are already applicable. We have the Services Directive, we have the E-Commerce Directive, we have the Directive on Unfair Commercial Practices, and, and more. And therefore we wanted to avoid to add another layer of rules to a dynamic sector that is continuously and very fast developing and evolving. The existing rules, in our view, are clear on the market access requirements. Any regulation restricting market access must be justified and proportionate 
to meet the legitimate public interest objectives that it, that it, wants, that it intends to pursue. Business authorization and licensing requirements, like they happen in many areas of the economy, should be imposed on services providers or uh, collaborative platforms only when it is really strictly necessary. It is in everyone's interest to reduce regulatory burden, particularly for all market operators. And therefore, in our view, absolute bans of an activity should only be a measure of really the last resort. And restrictions cannot favor one business model over another. And protecting existing business models is certainly not a reason to impose such requirements on a one-fits-all one approach on new business models. And therefore, we very much encourage the member states to take into account the specificities that the collaborative economy presents, applying the same rules to someone who provides a service occasionally, once or twice a month, and on a full-time professional may not be appropriate. One way of doing so is by ad adopting certain thresholds to differentiate this between peers and between prof and professional service of services providers. As we underlined in the platform's communication that was adopted also last year, in the framework of the digital single market, we ask collaborative economy platforms also something, to act in a responsible manner. They should put in place voluntary measures to increase consumer trust and to engage with governments on issues, for example, taxation. In the 2016 communication on the collaborative economy, we also tried to clarify that the assessment of whether a collaborative uh, platform is offering the actual service, be it in the area of transport or in the area of accommodation services, or is only acting as an intermediary between consumers, can only be done on a case-by-case -case basis. And to this extent, we provided criteria which determine the degree of control a platform exercise on the, on the provision of the service, which in our view is essential for such an assessment. The communication also explains when EU consumer rules have to apply and gives indications when actually a trader is not anymore a peer, uh, another private person, but is actually a trader. We identify the three cumulative criteria that are mentioned by the European Court of Justice, Justice when it comes to uh, define a worker for the purpose of the collaborative economy. We also underline that tax rules need to be complied. It cannot be that here is a sector where tax rules don't apply. Uh, so whether they, these transactions are digital or not, taxes have to be paid. And we have to look for ways actually to facilitate this tax collection and again try to reduce or keep the administrative burden low. Uh, next slide now. The, uh, most member states are developing specific strategies to deal with the collaborative economy or are introducing sector-specific legislation. One example, Portugal short-term rental, where new laws were adopted, which were actually then, it was decided, Portugal decided not to introduce them specifically for the collaborative economy, but the collaborative economy was a main driver for having, putting this law in place. Other member states were signing or were organizing the signature of memoranda of understandings, partnership agreements between uh, collaborative platforms, uh, for example, Estonia, but we will have, hear much more from Kalle, they have concluded a tax arrangement with Uber, which allows drivers to opt into a system where Uber sends then the income data for the drivers directly to the tax authorities, so it's all automatically added to the tax uh, return. In Belgium, they, they decided to create a specific tax regime for, for services in the collaborative economy. And it is actually enforced, again, with the support of platforms, because they have to register, and, um, and then there is a, an approval mechanism for, with the tax administration. In some member states, sectoral horizontal thresholds, either fiscal thresholds have been introduced, or sector-specific thresholds to distinguish between peers and professionals. The, example, the typical example is in the, in the area of short-term rental accommodation, 
you have uh, in Amsterdam, you can rent a home for, uh, for a maximum of 60 days per year, and you will still be considered a peer that rents to other peers. In London, they chose a slightly different approach. There, you can rent it out for 90 days before uh, you are con con considered that you do it on a professional basis. The Commission, we welcome national developments which provide for this balanced boost of the, uh, of the collaborative economy. However, you know, national laws, we also have to be careful that this doesn't lead to the fragmentation of the internal market. And there ha we also have seen developments where member states are, or at the, at the, at the level, at regional or local level, have gone for bans. And this, again, is of course uh, very bad for a functioning digital internal market and for the possibility to push for dynamic and innovative uh, economy, where all citizens, startups, and platforms are adequately empowered and embraced. Now, uh, I'd like to mention one project now for the future that we're currently examining, uh, because we thought we have to go a step further and avoid regulatory fragmentation and ensure that the EU law is applied correctly. And we have decided to do that on a sector-specific basis. And the first sector that we, where we want to go further in giving guidance, not legislation, but guidance, is the, the short-term uh, rental uh, um, economy, where, which is, kind of, as we know, one of the largest sectors. And it is offered by plat well-known platforms like HomeAway, Airbnb, AltaCase, and others. We have launched a public consultation at the beginning of this year specifically targeting citizens and startups that offer their apartment or a spare room for short-term rentals through collaborative platforms. There were several workshops taking place. It started in February, we've finished now in September, where we tried to, have a, to offer a forum to member states, to regions, to municipalities, to the platforms, to get together to exchange experiences and best practices in this specific sector. And this exchange already provided us with good input to give, an, to give everybody present an orientation for, the, for how we could develop the collaborative economy in this sector in a balanced way. And we think, we hope very much that we can come together again with, everybody, with all the stakeholders and with the national member states and regions involved to a set of guiding policy principles for, for this sector that then would we hope, guide the member states and the red, or at whatever, whatever level regulation, legislation is put into place, guide this, uh, this legislative process. I very much believe that we have to seize the opportunities that the collaborative economy offers, and we have to ensure the right environment. Europe should offer a competitive and fully functioning single market for these services, again, while not disregarding consumer and employees' protection and without favoring one business model over the other. In the title for the, my intervention, I was asked to talk about, is it uh, a piece or is it a centerpiece uh, of the future? I think the collaborative economy is more and more moving and with unstoppable moving towards center stage. And we all are in the business of getting it right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hubert. Very interesting uh, presentation. Kalle, it's your turn to share your unique experience, if you will, because uh, for a specialist center in Eastern Europe, uh, legislating these kind of issues is uh, a rather unknown thing. So the ups and downs, pros and cons of doing so. Your turn. Thanks, and thanks for the invitation. And uh, thanks uh, that you're still listening. So I don't have a presentation because I wanted to talk to you and I didn't want to, you to look at the slides and not listen what I say. So, so I'll try to make a really, really short. Uh, I give a short background about why we did it and then how we did it. So first, uh, why we did it. Um, we did it because I believe what uh, Chantal said, what uh, Philip said in the first panel, and what uh, currently the colleague from European Commission said. These are real facts. People want to use the service. 
sharing economy is not some parts of the economy, it's the economy in the age of digitalization. So the states can't blame the technology for developing uh, too fast. They can look at the mirror, the policymakers, I mean, and uh, blame that they could be um, too slow. So it happens because people downloaded Uber app in Estonia. They used Taxify, which is the fastest growing transportation app in uh, Europe, founded by Estonians. Um, and I believe people. Uh, I believe that for a politician, for a poli policymaker, the duty is to lead and to listen and to believe in his people. So I believe in people who want to use the service. I believe in people who want to earn extra by, by um, offering service through platforms. I believe in people who want to uh, participate in creating better and more environmental friendly public transportation system. And um, I believe in the change of mindset through that. What Chantal said um, in the beginning was that we, we are wasting um, too much money on investing to a car. We are, uh, let's say, wasting money and time uh, for, uh, for uh, let's say, hanging around in a traffic jam. It could be changed. It could be changed because of, of the technology. It could be changed because the way of working is, uh, is, is changing through these, uh, during these, uh, these years and, um, and days. So, coming in more details, uh, we uh, started with the ride-sharing uh, regulation approach in uh, 216, in February. And um, first, we had uh, also the opinion that sharing economy is something specific, and taxi sector is something uh, specific as well. But uh, we must uh, we must regulate them both, but uh, but not not in a similar way. Um, uh, but but we uh, where we uh, where we uh, let's say finally uh, finally reached uh, this uh, third reading in the in the parliament was that we liberalised totally the taxi market, which means that uh, an Uber driver in Estonia is a taxi driver as well. But the licensing process and the regulations uh, for the for the drivers, not the platforms and not for the taxi companies, are 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 very simple. So the focus is on a driver. So um, the uh, and all the regulations are, are for the driver as well, not for the companies and not for the not for the platforms. So <clears throat> it's a flexible regulation where even a taxi driver could participate in uh, in in the sharing economy. So so basically, if you only use an app for uh, for let's say. Uh, for providing the service, then, uh, then, then you have the lighter regulation. And if you, you want to use a taxi meter or a platform or uh, wait your customer in a taxi stop, I don't know who goes to a taxi stop nowadays, but still we have the taxi stop as well and in front of the hotel. So you must use a taxi meter and you must have a platform. If you want to use a public transportation line, you must have a uh, platform. Uh, on your on your car, so basically all all that is uh, all that is taxi. The process is fully digital, and it's written in the law that the licensing uh, can't uh, last longer than seven days. So basically, the initial approach was that uh, push the button, become a driver, but uh, we ended up uh, with the with the let's say uh, time limited with uh, with uh, with seven days. So basically, it's uh, it's simple, and as I mentioned, totally electronic. It's uh, the automatic check against the different registries. So it, it basically checks if you have a driver license, which is valid, if you have a, uh, a different kind of, let's say, criminal, criminal cases, uh, criminal cases or not, and, and, and so on and so on. So the only manual thing is to give a digital signature by a local municipality, let's say, officer, because they are issuing the, uh, the, the, the license. So it's easy. So what we did wrong? 
really drunk uh, when we started by trying to make, uh, let's say, special regulation for ride sharing and leave the regulation for taxi sector almost as it, as it was. And the suggestion for all the, uh, for all the uh, countries who would like to regulate the, the let's say, uh, economy nowadays, which uh, has become because of the digital platforms, is to, is to come uh, together in the middle. So please make a round table, invite taxi companies, invite, uh, invite uh, platforms, and try to find the, the, the solution which is, which is in the middle. I don't mean that, uh, that the regulations for taxis and, and platforms must be equal, but, uh, but uh, the policy makers and the sector itself has to understand that uh, this is not the competition between taxi and, and ride sharing, it's the competition between public transportation and the ownership of car. So in Estonia, after that, or let's say during that process, we made a study where we uh, asked uh, from the people that uh, are you, would you be ready to participate as a driver and would you be uh, ready to consider selling your family's second car and would you, uh, would you be ready to use the service. So 90% said that they would be ready to use the service as if it is uh, with a reasonable price. 49% said that they would be ready to sell their family's second car if the service is there, and 30% said that they would be ready to participate in, in creating this better transportation uh, system by, by becoming a, a driver. The other reason why we did it and why we, uh, why we think that uh, this, is the, this is the right way to, uh, to, to enable this service on the market was, uh, was the quality of the service. In Tallinn we have approximately 4,000 drivers Taxify, 4,000 taxi drivers then, back then in 2015, I'm talking about this data. Uh, Taxify started by bringing all the taxi drivers together to a one platform. And all these drivers had a license issued by the local municipality according to the law which, uh, which was uh, written by the state. Within the few, uh, first few months, 1,500 drivers were excluded from the platform because of the bad feedback the drivers got. So basically you can make the law as hard as possible, but the only time uh, public officials check the uh, taxi drivers are at the time when they issue the license. Not again, ever again. Maybe, maybe it would be possible if the, if the uh, authorities would check them maybe, I don't know, three, time, uh, three times in one year or something like that. But basically, if you have this uh, live feedback after every drive, which is the concept that Uber uses, which is the concept that Taxify uses, which is the concept that most of the sharing economy platforms are using, so uh, you can make the service much better. And without any regulation uh, had to be done by the by the state. We create more jobs. I mean, at the time uh, of, uh, of um, people traveling around, um, youth um, unemployment, where it's hard to find a flexible way to earn income, we have to enable again the services for the, for the people who would like to participate in, uh, in providing these services. One, really good thing that I'm really, really happy about is that uh, Uber and Taxify even, even um, uh, uh, offered this opportunity for the people who, who have problems with, it, with hearing. So people who don't hear anything, they have less opportunities to work somewhere. But as it is digital, I mean, the platform is digital, you, you enter where you would like to pick up and you enter your final destination. So there's no need to communicate to anybody. You'll have the address, GPS uh, gives you this uh, direction and, uh, and, uh, and it's easy, easy to earn income. So, so we have, I think, more than 30 drivers already in Tallinn who, who, who basically don't hear anything, but uh, they have the ability to, uh, to, uh, to drive. Now taxation, and this, this is the most interesting part. 
Um, as said before, um, we have the solution that, uh, that's uh, worked out in a collaboration with Uber, with Taxify, and with Estonian Tax and Customs Board, which enables, uh, to, which enables automatically to clear all your income you earned by driving at the platform. So this is a technological solution between uh, driver app and the Estonian Tax and Customs Board. Uh, everything is, is, is online, just one click. And uh, one very important principle that we have is that this is not mandatory. So this is the driver's decision whether they want to send the information or not. Because we are not a police country. If we make it mandatory for the platform to send the information, then we have next time have to have to make it mandatory for the cafes, for the for the shops, for everybody. We're not a police uh, state. We are a state that wants to enable things, wants to create the hassle-free society, the environment where it's easy to earn income, where it's easy to pay taxes. Uh, we have had um, we've had some electronic tax declarations. I don't know more than 15 years already. And we must hide the date where, where the tax declaration uh, uh, starts because people want to declare their taxes in the first minutes and hours. Last year, during the first hour, we had 60,000 uh, tax declarations already, already um, uh, uh, sent. So, so basically, uh, basically it's, it's about the tax moral. And that's why we didn't want to make it, uh, make, it, uh, make it mandatory as well. So basically, tax is not an issue. And um, today I had a discussion with a journalist as well here. And, uh, and he said that, uh, that if you don't make it mandatory, then it won't work. I said that I'm ready to continue with the discussion when you bring me the taxi company who has been a tax compliant so far. So taxi sector has been mostly cash based. And I'm, I'm ready to bet that uh, none of the companies has been 100% tax compliant so far and none of the taxi companies have uh, turned to a tax and customs board with their own initiative that let's work out a solution how, how our drivers and how our, let's say, uh, self-employed uh, people could, uh, could pay taxes in a, in a more easier way. So that was the Estonian, let's say, story that uh, Uber and Taxify went to Tax and Customs Board before any discussion about the regulation started and said that we would like to pay taxes because everything is digital. It would be easy. It would be the best country to, uh, to try and test it. And I, I can talk about that later, but, but basically, uh, thanks to that solution and thanks to our e-governance system and our e-residency program where everybody could become an e-resident of Estonia, we could collect all the taxes worldwide for different uh, Uber and Taxify drivers because if a driver becomes a new resident of Estonia then um, the municipality of Prague for example says that oh we would like to get that percent of tax and uh, we, we could collect it uh, on behalf of you just uh, name the percentage and uh, and uh, and we will uh, we will uh, make a transaction uh, to you and it's um, it's as easy as that one last thing, um, in most of the countries, uh, taxi service has been a luxury service. And it's because of many reasons. But, um, but I think that um, enabling, again, these platforms, these services to the market helps, um, helps people with saving the time, with saving the money, and with saving them from the investments to buy uh, by their own uh, own car because of the service has been bad the prices are quite quite high uh, another suggestion for for the for the cities for the states who who have had this taxi medallion system which is the which is basically the gap for the licenses for 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 taxis in brussels they have it i think that one license costs about 50000 in uh, in new york a taxi medallion uh, costs probably a million in Rome, I, th I think it's somewhere around, or at least it was around 100,000 or something like that. So basically, 
what uh, what we could do in Europe to uh, to to offer a solution for the for the taxi sector as well is to use the experience uh, uh, like Toronto did in Canada. So they basically made a foundation that all the drivers uh, sent 4% of their income to this foundation and from that uh, they, they compensated the uh, investment for the, for the taxi medallions, for the taxi licenses. So it could be done in Brussels, it could be done in Rome and in many other um, countries where we have uh, that uh, kind of system. So I encourage all the countries, Czech Republic, and the neighboring countries to be uh, with, uh, with the Nordic states, Nordic countries. Uh, the service is legal uh, currently in Finland. It will go in force, of course, uh, uh, next summer, but they, they have the regulation already. Uh, ours uh, goes to force in uh, November 1st of this year. Uh, Latvia just passed the law uh, last week. And Lithuania did it um, a bit earlier than, uh, than we, but, but they did the same thing that we wanted to do uh, in, in the first phase. So basically they have separate regulation for, for ride sharing and separate regulation for, for taxis. But the only solution that I suggest is to decrease the regulation for taxis, put some regulation for ride sharing, and there it is. So that's, uh, that's the approach that, that, uh, that we did. But, of course, in more detail, I would be happy to answer during the panel. Thank you very much, Colin. Very interesting. I know that Jan made himself a lot of uh, notes, so uh, just long story short, is it a good way to go? Is it, uh, is it a way that uh, we as Czechs can or should copy? And before Jan takes over, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, you still have a chance to actually pose questions. There are some new ones, there are some that actually overlap from the first panel, so we will going to recycle them. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, I'll start, uh, as every bad speaker, by thanking. Um, I want to thank my both four speakers, because they have basically done my job for me, in the sense that maybe, it's, maybe it was the decision of the University of Economics to invite three, three speakers who share absolutely the same view, although we're coming from three different perspectives. We have the Commission, the God guys, we have a, a deputy, and we have a civil servant. And actually, this, it, it's, it just can copy the notes to say everything that the Ministry of Industry and Trade, how we think about the collaborative economy. Um, there are many reasons. Um, I'll try to put them short. Uh, excuse me for being a bit vulgar, but uh, we think there is a generation gap in general. It doesn't apply to everyone. I know Herbert Yorbos is definitely a different case. Um, she understands. But in general, we see there is a difference in perspective. Uh, the generation X, Y, and Z, they don't want to own a car. That's a new thing. That's it, some of you guys here, um, younger than, than us. Owning is no longer uh, something that they feel is necessary. And that changes the perspective. I still am from a generation who, if I buy myself a Tesla, I'll feel happy. The younger people, it's no longer that for everyone. So in the same way, the state is, when, the, when we design the policy, we get the same, we gain the same reaction. If you speak to most of the older generation people, us and older, me and, me and, me and older, you get that reaction. We need to get this right. We, make, we need to make sure that we get the rules right. We need to control everything. We need to know every driver, what they, how much they own. It's not like that. If we try to invent the rules, and Kale was saying this exactly, if we try to do, design the rules this way, we will end up with the collaborative economy moving into the, from gray to black zone, and the, the state won't collect a euro in their, in, in their taxes. So that's not the approach we, we are trying to take. But it takes time to explain this, um, explain this around. And of course, you can have a quick fix and ban Uber. Some countries have, have done that, or ban, and ban Airbnb. Two countries have done that. Their constitutional courts have said, no, you can't ban Airbnb. That's, that's con against your constitution. So that's also not the way. Um, so we're trying to explain that if we make a lax Uber, in three months we'll be sitting here again and trying to invent a new lax Uber 2, lax Uber 3, lax Uber... No, that's not how it works. We need to get the rules right to make sure that we fit 
the traditional businesses and the new businesses into one field where they can both operate. This means we need to get fair framework for everyone. It doesn't mean we need to have same rules. If you want to have same rules, that's the old jokes about the guys taking care of the, of the carriages in New York, um, that they were responsible for cleaning the, how to say it, the remains from the horses after they have done their service. And when cars were invented, the, these co-chair drivers wanted to, for the car drivers to have the same rules. No, that's not how it works. We, we need to think a bit more in the future. Uh, Carla mentioned an important thing, and that's the trust. The Estonian government, it was, uh, my boss was in, in Estonia last week, and he spoke to the uh, CIO of the Estonian government, and he told me, as Carla did today, we trust our citizens. We, we trust they're not dumb. If they're able to use an online platform like Uber, we trust they understand to a certain extent how that works and what they can expect from the service. We shouldn't be the government that takes care of every little detail and makes, makes sure that the consumer is hyper-protected. That's also not how it works. Two American economists have calculated a theoretical number. If you combine the number of sectors in the economy where the uh, collaborative economy is operating already, times the different ways you can work in a collaborative economy, you come to a theoretical number of 729 uh, business, new business models. No, we won't have 729 new business models, but we will have hundreds. We don't know which they will be. No government can know that in, in advance. So you need to get a framework where as many as possible of these new models fit in the future. We are trying to get this approach, and this is with what we're coming to the meeting uh, at, the, at the Prime Minister's office tomorrow for the meeting that you might have, might have heard about uh, in the media. Uh, Hubert, and the communication of the Commission, I'm not sure, but I think it is the first time when the Commission, and Hubert was maybe even too modest, said we are not going to regulate straight away, although you're asking for it. We will wait for this segment to grow. If there are clear problems, we will fix them in a surgical way. We like that approach. But it's also, it takes some, I guess, courage, and it takes some innovative, uh, better regulation thinking to come to terms with, with such an approach. Kale was saying about the transparency. Uh, if every drive that an Uber driver makes is registered online somewhere, being it the Netherlands or, uh, or Ireland or, or United States, but it is somewhere online in this modern world, uh, you have ways to, to get to, to, to approach this information. You collect more taxes, because as the driver knows, uh, his ride has been recorded somewhere. If you take a taxi, I don't want to make surveys here because it's, it's five in the afternoon, but if you take a taxi, how often do you get your receipt without asking for it? One case out of 10, probably. I think that's a, fair, that's a fair estimate, which means that the nine rides may not have been declared. That means no taxes. With Uber, it's more difficult because the driver is on the risk of, of getting control. The same works for Airbnb. Um, the Estonian law, we really like it. I have studied it carefully with my colleagues. We hope we will get as much inspiration from that law for the way uh, we regulate in the Czech Republic, because we are in a phase where some regulation will be necessary, as I was explaining, to get the framework right. They have done a really good thing, and all the things that Kale was saying also about the things that they might have done differently, uh, that's something that we, we totally share. We, let's just you know, keep your fingers crossed for us so that we, so that we, we manage. Uh, the self-regulation, the ratings, it's also a great thing. Um, if the state tells you this platform is good, this platform is bad. How, much, how many of you will trust that judgment? Uh, if 400 users have said, this driver is good, this driver is bad. Or if you're an Uber driver, if they tell you this client is, was a great chap, or this client, client was really bad, and, and 40 uh, drivers say the same thing, that changes your, your judgment. The state does not have to, um, to regulate that, um, only to a very small extent. And now, to um, what you know, what do we do now? So we have for the government, we have a legal study and we have an economic study. The legal st study is on the whole country. The um, the economic study is on uh, accommodation in Prague. It shows us a few things. Um, it shows us that the potential 
the study doesn't say that, but what we have read from the study, the potential for the sharing economy, for the Czech economy in 2020 is up to one, two or three percent of GDP. If you compare this to accommodation services or transport services, these are also around 2% of Czech GDP. So the potential, of course, that's a theoretical number again, is, is there. Uh, so we need to, to do something because it's, not, it's no longer, um, it's no longer um, after birth uh, like it was um, a year ago. Uh, so on the 4th of September, the government adopted a resolution number 615, which gives homework for every member of the government to look at the existing legislation and to say, yes, this applies to certain parts of the sharing economy. Yes, we need to change that law for this particular reason. Uh, and the digital coordinator, Onze Mari, who was supposed to be here today, and he sends his regards, and he would really like to, love to be here, but he, he cannot for health reasons. His job will be to put this all together and say, okay, so this is the, this is the overall picture, and this is what we are going to do. Uh, the pressure is there, but we don't want to cede to a pressure that is unhealthy. Good pressure is, of course, fine. Bad pressure is bad. We want to get that right, and we want to get it right the first time, like the Estonians did with, um, with their, with their uh, uh, lax Uber. Uh, so to finish off with, uh, as I was saying, please keep your fingers crossed that for once that your government is able to come with a solution that is sustainable, durable, and for the benefit of the Czech economy, which, believe me, is not an easy task, but we have inspiration from Estonia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. Uh, before the warm-up round again, one, uh, let me say, follow-up question, and you know, you probably expected this one. You said that there are potentially 700 business models that can sooner or later emerge, and we should create a legislation that will somehow facilitate it, or will at least frame it in a way that's you know, uh, it will provide for some uh, reasonable solution. Uh, just an outline, how could be done a, a task like that? What should such a legislation essentially entail? If you have an idea, because quite honestly, to me, that's so abstract that I don't. Long story short. Thank you. Um, please don't tell my minister that within the discussion we, we had with the minister, he's from a social democratic party. Uh, and we told him the only way forward to do that is to deregulate the entire sector. So the number of regulations you have now for the taxi drivers or for Uber, just decrease them, decrease the number, make it simple. And the same way, if the Uber drivers are, change, are, are crossing the law, some of them are, some of them aren't, then make them do it. Make more controls, be more stringent from bottom. So that's, you, if you combine these two approaches, and you deregulate the entire sector. We think that's the only solution which can be fair in the long run. So less of a state regulation, more of, for instance, reviews? Well, that's what the Estonians did. They are saying, if you want to be a, a driver on the street that picks people from the street, you are a taxi driver, you need your lamp, you need your meter, that, just like today. But if you are driving over an online platform, you don't need a light on your car. You don't need to have a taxi meter. All you need is the app. That's basically the approach. Thank you. Gentlemen, a question to you all. Uh, Hubert already tackled that or mentioned that in his presentation. We have European level, national level, and local levels. Should all three have something to say? Should they intervene in the reg regulatory process? Or what's the division of labor that would or should work or could work, to be precise, in your eyes, from your perspective, Hubert? Thank you. I, I used to work in regional policy and there uh, one of our mottos was always the regions are closest to the citizens and therefore particularly uh, good to, to know what's going on on the ground and to, and to get it right, for example, also in regulation. I think it probably, there is not, again, there are no, not one, one size fits all approach on regulation. It, it very much depends, you know, on, on Airbnb in a city like Prague, you might need different rules than in, in, uh, in another place. So you will have to look again there, more sector-specific. And Philippe, for example, argued that we should look at more sector-specific rules, which I, I, I totally would, would, uh, would un un sign also up for. Uh, on, the, on the European level, we decided con very consciously that 
there are also already certain rules that are in place and that give a framework for any rules that member states or regions or municipalities want to adopt. And what we plead for, what we demand of course even, is that, that you look at these rules and whatever rules you come up with is uh, that they are in conformity with that. In a member state, again, the situation will also be different whether it's a region or the national level, depending on the constitutional orders. In countries like Germany or, uh, or Austria, a lot of these rules, there, there is the, 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 the member state itself, the national state, doesn't have the competence to, 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 to adopt rules there. So it will, again, be there, is, there will be differences between, uh, between uh, different member states. And what was possible in Estonia is not necessarily one-to-one -one transmittable, but I think people should, and other countries should look very closely to the experiences that are made in other member states with certain rules and learn and, and, and try to make, get it right. Okay, uh, so let's say there are, and probably should not be, one-size-fits-all policies or regulations. Uh, a case study or one concrete example or question from Slido how does the European Commission see the issue of employment rights of the platform's participants? Uh, should be, for example, Uber drivers able to organize into unions? And should European Commission get involved in this kind of issue, or in this issue in particular? Thank you. I saw the question up there and I thought, well, I think that is actually an area where where the situation is clear, employee, uh, uh, the rights of em employees are the same in any, uh, in any area of, uh, of the economy. They are actually fundamental rights. And there is one of the fundamental rights that we have at the European level and that in all member states is the right to, to associate. You know? And so the, I would say, of course, workers in the sharing economy uh, should also have this right to associate to form trade unions. The crooks, of course, in the case is who is a worker and who is not a worker. And that's a big discussion that is going on, in particular in the area, and Uber is, uh, is the, 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 the flagrant example where there are different views. You know, because Uber, the platform, is of course arguing, I'm not dealing with employees, I'm dealing with independent entrepreneurs, and there, this is, uh, there, there, is, there is no fundamental right of uh, entrepreneurs to, to, form, to form a trade union, at least in the current place. And so that, that, that will be, there will be, there are court judgments, I'm sure. At a certain moment, the, the, this question will also go up to the, to the European Court of Justice, who will give us a right, uh, an answer that then the Commission will certainly follow. Colin. I don't know, it, maybe the consumers should form a union as well. I mean, that, uh, that uh, states would enable these services, but, uh, but let's, let's, let's leave it there. Um, I'm not too familiar with all the, let's say, tax sectors in European Union in, in different countries, but I, I know very well what, what happened in Estonia. And, and the 95% of the taxi drivers out of this 4,000 were self-employed, so basically they created their own, the, let's say, their own way of of working, paid for their own uh, health insurance to get the social umbrella. So basically, any taxi company didn't uh, didn't take care of the drivers in another way than providing them a car with from what uh, they asked quite a high rental. And they provided them maybe these taxi stops and maybe this dispatch service, which nowadays is, is anyway a, a history. So if we come up with the social rights, then we must have a solution for the, for the future workplaces, let's say, overall. It's not only ride sharing, it's about, it's about all the things. It's about the sharing economy and the future of work. So I believe that uh, the, the current, let's say, trade unions approach that this kind of social um, security and the way to achieve that is going to change anyway. So we better be prepared for that. And, uh, and, and it's not, let's say, trying to fit the new things to the old, old framework in terms of social security as well. I'm back to my uh, original question, uh, the three levels, European level, state level, 
st state level and local level uh, regulation. Should all three get involved, uh, and how should potential power sharing, if you will, look like from your perspective? I don't know if we if we have the fifth freedom uh, in European Union, which is the free movement of data, and uh, and with that there should be an approach that we we will enable digital services to uh, to our markets, then definitely we don't need the uh, Europe-wide uh, approach. Um, it should be local. Local politicians uh, should take it, the sharing economy as such, uh, ride-sharing uh, in a more specific way as one of the tools for, for policy-making. I mean, environmental protection, the, uh, the arrangement for public transportation, the planning for cities, um, all that kind of stuff. This is the perfect tool for them. So why should we uh, say from, uh, from, uh, from European Commission that you must do this and that? You should find out your own way how to plan your, uh, your cities, your capitals and your public transportation system. And um, uh, the, that, that could be the, the best approach. Of course, it's not that, that easy in, in, in many countries. But what, what would I suggest to, uh, to, to all the people in the audience is to elect um, these politicians who who at least mention digitalization and enabling digital services in their programs. Because in Germany, as you, as you, as you saw during the last elections, uh, big parties, the CDU and Social Democrats, they almost didn't mention digitalization at all. And FTP, the Liberals, their main approach was the reforms and digitalization, and thanks to that, I believe that liberals got again to the parliament, and um, and I hope that during uh, your elections, which are uh, which are close, quite close, uh, you'll also let's say um, find your way from there. Well, we just did an audit with a, a group of my friends uh, of uh, programs, so they all mentioned digitization. The question is to what extent they know what they're talking about, but that's something I can say, and uh, and Jan probably can't. Uh, anyway, we were talking about three others, so let me start with a case study, the current events, and I've already mentioned it a couple of times, the sort of a ten tension, sometimes even turbulences between Uber and taxi drivers, and the response of uh, the mayor of, um, of Prague, Mrs. Konachua, who said, you know, it's not my problem, it's the government's or uh, Ministry of Trade and Industry problem, so where do you think should and could by the solution and how fast it can come. And that's from the digitalization, but on the three of us, we finally have a case for discussion because I don't entirely agree with, with what Carla said about the three levels. Because if we only leave it to the municipalities, I was. I meant no, states. States, okay, well then, yeah, member states, then yes, because on the municipal level, there could be a lot of vested interest. If you get fragmented rules, you get fragmented single market, and that's, that's, that's for nothing. There is an international aspect to it. If you are an Uber user, you expect a certain standard. Of course, Uber has a different legal regime in every country. On the level of the app, you, accept, you, you expect a certain standard. If you get a totally different service from Paris and Prague, that's probably not right. That's fragmented single market, that's very close to my heart, so I wouldn't like that. So it's also the rule for the Commission to say, these are the barriers, these are the existing legislation. We can give you guidance on how also based on the workshop that Uber was making, how we think that this could be done. Um, on, the, on Uber, I will not going to, um, I'm not going to comment on, on the mayor's uh, um, remarks on Uber, but I will, I will escape from the question by mentioning the discussion in Prague on Airbnb. Because Prague is very specific in Airbnb, that's also the study that the government has, uh, is based on, on accommodation services on, through platforms in Prague. It shows that Prague 1 and Prague 2 are totally different, especially Prague 1, totally different cases compared to the entire rest of the country. So if we were to base our policy on the study did, which was made on Prague 1, we would get it very wrong. If you imagine Yulove u Prahi, you get one hotel, uh, but you can, have, you, can have five, you can have five rooms in around that little town where no hotel could ever make profit because it's just not enough clients. But with Airbnb, with the simplified rules, you can make a profit, you can bring money to the local economy without, uh, without having all the, ha all the hassle and, and, and actually making a profit. So that's a very different case where, where the state should not be basing it also its entire framework 
on a particular example, although we need to that something has to be done with the case of Prague because there are now significant problems that many people complain about. But we should, we should think of both Yulala Uprahe and Prague 1. There was a question posed during the, the first panel that was very specific and addressed uh, the situation mostly in Prague 1 and Prague 2, meaning that more and more you have people, rich people, buying uh, apartments, renting them out, meaning that to an extent you're essentially changing the, the city or the part of the city. You know. it's, hollowing, it's being hollowed out, if you will. Should at that moment uh, the regulator somehow intervene? And, and if I get it correctly, it should be Prague, if the, the answer to, the, to my question is yes. That would be a question to the Minister of Regional Development, but I'll try to help from my very personal perspective. Uh, we think that this is basically a natural process for any city in the Euro-Atlantic world. All big cities are getting hollowed out from the center. We have seen this in East Germany. We are seeing this now in Prague. We're trying to get data from Airbnb on the actual share of the real sharing economy, which means I have a spare room and I'm renting it out through Airbnb, and the commercial rental, I own three apartments and I rent them uh, on, on, on Airbnb. Uh, they are not willing to provide this data, I, I understand. They are not obliged to, they are a service of the information society, so they don't have to. Uh, but it would be interesting uh, to, to get the proportion. Our estimate is that the real sharing is about a fourth in Prague, and semi-real sharing is about a half. Semi-real sharing, I mean, I have two apartments, I live in Brussels, I rent out my Prague apartment, but I live in Brussels. So that's like semi semi-sharing, uh, because it's still my own property. And 50% is probably, but we don't know, is probably companies that own several, um, several uh, apartments or blocks of houses which are renting through Airbnb. Colin, your take on hollowing out of uh, the cities. I can talk uh, about uh, the Italian experience. And a few, few friends of mine, colleagues of mine, are, are renting out their apartments, and they are usually like, you know, when you, when you order an Uber, you talk with the driver. When you uh, rent out your apartment, you talk with the, with the tourists. And uh, <clears throat> as we are a neighboring country of, uh, of Russia, we have quite a lot of tur tourists from, uh, from Russia. And as you know, the economic situation in Russia isn't good uh, at the moment. And they are, they are really honest, saying that uh, if you wouldn't have these, uh, let's say, uh, short-term rental apartments on Airbnb in Tallinn, we couldn't afford to come to visit Tallinn. So I think that this is the same with Prague, this is the same with, uh, with Amsterdam, with, uh, with, uh, with all, the, all the cities that uh, tourists uh, love, to, love to visit. I mean, again, this is not a competition between a hotel and uh, the apartment, it's a competition between different cities, different region that, uh, that uh, tourists love to, uh, love to visit. So, so I believe in it. Now about regulation and uh, again this tax issue. In Estonia we have the challenge that uh, even the, even the long-term rentals uh, don't pay too much taxes. Again, this is too uh, complicated system again and again. So, so we are trying to find out the solution for both, for long-term rentals, for short-term rentals, make this uh, level of, uh, let's say, income tax uh, motivating for, for everybody to, to pay taxes, because if, we, if the level is too high and nobody is paying taxes, you're getting zero. If you put a, a smaller amount, you'll get all the owners paying taxes, you'll get at least something. So, so this, is, this is our approach and uh, what we would like to do. So solve two things, long-term rental, short-term rental, as we need with, um, with ride-sharing. So, so solving, I mean, four, five different things altogether. Very interesting uh, suggestion or question that somehow impli implies a possible solution to what we're talking about. There appears to be socially embedded rules built on trust and reputation in the sharing economy. What's the EU's perspective on collaborating with the industry to develop self-governing rules? So that's the question to you, but uh, I, would ask, I would like to ask the two of you on uh, for your take, essentially, what do you think about something like that? Hubert. This is certainly an approach that we want to follow insofar as we want to, as I mentioned, for the specific sector of, of the uh, short-term rental accommodations, we want to bring together 
regions, municipalities, member states, uh, stakeholders, consumer organizations, platforms, to, to discuss and to, to, to ideally devise, or devise these, these principles, these rules, or uh, to how they, should, how they want to collaborate at the end. It is, you know, it can only work when, when there is an environment where the platforms, platforms can thrive. This is very much in the interest of uh, also of the, of the municipalities. But there might also be certain rules might be necessary. And the example of the ghost cities, if, I, if you allow me, um, you know, th there might be specific situations. I don't know how many of you in, in the summer, there was a protest of the citizens of Barceloneta, which is the, the part of Barcelona who, is, who has its own beach. And the citizens were, uh, the inhabitants of, uh, quite a few of them, were coming to the beach and protesting, and it was on TV, and so saying that uh, we have to we have to leave our neighborhood. Uh, I don't have neighbors anymore. Well, or I have many neighbors because they change every four days. Because most apartments in my block, where I live since 20 years, are now used by uh, Airbnb and, uh, and other platforms. So there might be situations where, where it could lead in an extreme case to these ghost cities. And there might be therefore situations where regulation might be justified that goes further than, for example, just a, a notification, you know? If, if, a, if a municipality can really prove this, uh, this effect of, of, of really ghost cities or part of, part of cities kind of uh, having no, no proper continuous population anymore, there might be a, 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 they might be able to make a good case to say there should be limitations how many apartments are, are rented out in, out in an area. But it, it, it has to be very good evidence and convincing evidence that, that, that should come in the thing. So to come back, should be the self-regulation. From our perspective, uh, as I said before, we don't mind so much if it's municipalities, if it's regions or national member states who, who regulate as long as they respect the, 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 the framework that is, that is given uh, by EU law and that is not to fragment uh, the, the internal market, or at least not to fragment more than necessary or justified or proportioned the internal market that we want to have. Also for the companies that are active in the, in the, in the sharing economy. Kalle and Jan, to what extent is it actually possible to talk to the stakeholders that have very often very opposing perspectives, you know, owners of the hotels and uh, uh, Airbnb or cabbies and Uber drivers? And it really depends on what stakeholders you talk about. Um, if I use one figure, that's from the Czech trade inspection. So far, there have been zero complaints from, from consumers on uh, the, um, on the, um, let's say, uh, on the service providers based on the, the, the common ratings on the stars. Consumers are happy. Of course, they're happy because the price is lower. That's the main reason that they still are, are happy. Uh, when you speak to the people who provide services on Airbnb, that's clear. And when you speak to the traditional business, hoteliers, depends. Uh, of course, for them, partly they are losing business, but it's only partly. Because um, unless the statistics have changed, the uh, clients of Airbnb and the clients of Uber are new clients. These are not old clients from hotels or taxi drivers. If you speak to a typical client of Uber, they say they hate taxi drivers. If you speak to people who live, who sleep a night on Airbnb, often they're people who don't like hotels. It's, it's slightly decreasing um, with the rest of the business, but still that's, that's, uh, that's one thing. Second thing is um, then we see the, the, the way forward that like Booking.com has done. Booking.com now offers part of it, it's very slight, but still it's part of the accommodation they're offering on the, from the peers, from actual, from actual shared economy. So they, have, they understood that it's, it's, it's new business and they're using it. One thing that I'd like to add, uh, not commenting what I said before, is, uh, is that I believe in a free market economy. So the competition. And one thing that has happened uh, bad, I believe, with Booking.com is that uh, they are the monopoly at the moment. So basically you can't uh, uh, survive as a hotel if you're not in Booking.com. So what we could do in, uh, in, in EU and with the ride sharing is not to let one platform to become a monopoly. 
because uh, once they uh, they are different, we have different platforms. But once uh, they operate without the regulation and with quite high, let's say, investments uh, by their investors and earn, uh, earn income while the smaller startups and smaller ride-sharing operators don't have enough money to pay or the penalties and, and, and so on and so. So, so basically, um, we, kill the, uh, we kill the competition. And if we kill the competition, the prices will, will go higher and the quality could go lower. So, so what we should enable is the competition uh, to make the uh, to enable that is to create the environment and create the regula regulation as soon as possible, and then we can have uh, more people using public transportation instead of using their own cars in uh, in European Union. And one thing that I'd like to suggest to you, which I have probably suggested to many of your bosses, <laughs> is that uh, is that uh, European uh, climate policy and environment environmental policy. The biggest challenge is transport sector. And one thing that uh, you, the, uh, what the, you usually suggest, I mean European Commission, is to lower the emissions in every engine, in every car. We saw that it's not uh, possible in all the cases, Volkswagen case. So, um, so why not um, putting up the proposal to decrease the number of cars? This is what, uh, what Chantal and, uh, and Blah Blah Car is doing to commute people to a to a one car and enabling these services. We will reach the European climate policy uh, targets. Of course, we would connect ele electro mobility and autonomous uh, uh, vehicles to that as well. But by only trying to mix biofuel to a conventional diesel. Uh, by only motivating people to change from gasoline to diesel or from that to gas is not helping us. We should get the number of cars, uh, let's say, smaller, and sharing economy is the solution here. What, what do you think, Hubert? <laughs> I, I, that's why I think you, I, ha I hope I have come across as an advocate for the sharing economy here. And that's why I'm here, because it has many positive aspects, including, as, as, as Kala said, and as, as Chantal made a very eloquent the point before, on the climate and on the, on the environment. Uh, I have a slight problem in going as far as you, that, that you know, the European Commission or the EU should ban cars, because... Motivate, <laughs> not Motivate, yeah. Um, yeah, the thing is, we... It's a little bit difficult to, that, that, that Europe says to citizens, you, um, you, you can't or you shouldn't buy. We can work on some things like telling the member states you should, on, on, at the European level, we impose limits, like for example uh, on emissions, and then the member states are left how they, how they do it. So I think it's rather member state. For example, Estonia, are you going into, going into <laughs> bad cars? Okay. Uh, no, no, no. Before, before, I, I, I have to add. I have to add one thing. I, I, were, I was not talking about banning cars, but motivating to use as a, other other ways of doing it. Just one example, which I which I uh, have uh, have made in quite a many audiences, is that uh, Finland and Germany believed that Siemens, is no, uh, Siemens and Nokia are their let's say flagships, until people lost faith in mobile phones with buttons when the iPhone came. So we know what happened in Finland. In Finland, the economy collapsed. In Germany, Siemens survived because they had so many other, let's say, fields as well. But it could happen with the European, uh, let's say, automotive industry if the combination of electric uh, mobility and autonomous driving uh, plus platforms will come to, uh, uh, will, will become a reality. I think that some of the uh, some of the car producers will come out with a solution where, where people would like to use it and start using it because it's more uh, let's say feasible to do that and then uh, then we are uh, ahead of a bigger problem and especially the German economy I mean this is this this is the challenge and this this is something that the European Commission probably should uh, should consider. Okay, three points. Sorry, guys. Just I'm good. Well, not just. <laughs> Because of this, One you see car, car, car manufacturers going into carpooling. We see it's happening. You know? 
okay. companies of carpooling companies are owned by car companies. Uh, coming back to what Carla said, obviously I have to ask, uh, what is uh, your take uh, as a representative of the ministry on uh, this very significant process of transformation, transformation of the automotive, given the importance of automotive for the Czech economy. And maybe if there are any journalists in the audience, uh, Hubert said the EU is not going to ban usage of a car. So, okay, just given, given the Czech Republic and, uh, and uh, uh, a certain very specific take on the so-called bad Brussels, I want to stress this one once again. They are not going so far. Thank you, Roman. Okay. Jan. I know very little about cars, but if, you, if you've noticed the last week, uh, the Czech government signed a memorandum with the Czech uh, automotive industry, which sets out a large plan. The government has a large plan. I think it's got 25 like, very concrete steps in which it wants to challenge this. Of course, everyone, both the car companies and the Czech government are aware. Uh, that the high dependence of the Czech economy on producing cars is a potential danger. Uh, so I would um, leave this question by um, sending you to the memorandum sign. Thank you. Fair enough. Okay, are there any questions or comments at this point? Because I'm about to pose a last one. No? Okay. Gentlemen, or I'm, I'm answering the last question. It's three minutes if you're slow. So the last question over here. Uh, that was part of my question. Okay, thank you. I will raise it from our brilliant list. Gentlemen, and you, you actually somehow mentioned it already, Kala. Politicians should lead. That's a quote from your presentation. And I will actually add one more thing we were discussing before the beginning of the conference. The difficulty for policymakers to actually keep up pace with the groundbreaking pace of the technological change. So, how to cope with it, or as policymakers, obviously, coming from different sides, if you will, but all policymakers in a sense, how do you perceive this issue? What to do about it? And can we do something about it at the moment? Because so far it seems like we're catching up and we're, we're, we're playing the game of a, a, a cat and a mouse and we're losing, if you will. Jan, yeah, let's start with you. Okay, it might sound blunt or even stupid, but the experience that we have had with the one in one and a half years of working with the sharing economy is that policymakers, just like the new platforms, have to be extremely innovative and look for solutions which are just not we are not used to introducing in, in policy making. Which is the good example is the Commission's communication. We are trying to do the same uh, with the law on, 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 on Uber. So I think it is innovation in better regulation. I think one, one thing, when we think about legislating, we always, I would like to have a, a poster in all, in, all the, in all the offices of, of, of bureaucrats like me, uh, be careful. Be careful because it's very, the things are moving very fast, in particular in this sector. So try to get it right, be careful, uh, and keep in mind what exactly is the problem that you want to solve, and check very diligently whether the measure that you think might solve this problem, whether it's really the right one. Be careful. Got it? What was the question exactly? <laughs> I think it's already uh, the, the, the policymaker's ability to cope with the change, uh, you know, the sort of a time it takes to react for the yeah. apparatus, if you will, versus, yes, I, I understand, I I said it was uh, about the leadership. That's uh, that's definitely. But uh, yeah. but uh, according to our experience, I think that um, the Estonian e-governance system uh, wouldn't be achieved if we wouldn't cooperate it with the private sector. So the public sector will never be as competent as the private sector. So. Uh, I suggest to collab collaborate, and uh, and that's why we started with the e-tax and tax customs board with electronic identity, and currently we are providing more than 2,800 different e-services to our citizens and companies in Estonia, thanks to private sector because they have been leading the process in a, from a development side, and we have enabled the uh, regulatory framework for them in cooperation 
So, so, and the good way to do it is to start uh, together. I mean, one part starts developing the technology, and the other part starts to starts to uh, create the regulation. And one thing that the policymakers and uh, legislators must be ready nowadays is that if they change leg legislation today, it could be changed in half years uh, later as well because uh, because there is no certainty like it was uh, five years ago that once you change the regulation it will be there for the next 10 years because this is the good platform for everything as the technology change we need to uh, we need to keep up with that uh, on, a, on a regulatory basis as well and again it's it's good politicians have a job <laughs> thank you uh, i left you not because uh, there is something personal but we have a comment here from the gentleman. Thank you. My name is Dr. Shwaib. Um, I'm so much uh, happy to hear so much details about the sharing economics. I'm a political scientist and a lecturer. I'm actually, I'm not so much you know, an economist, but I just want to ship in some simple um, a contribution. Looking at the Europeans, most of the European countries, I'm too much aware most of the European uh, countries are manufacturers of, let's say, for example, the car industries. And the level I have seen the steps or the shifts, the a kind of a sharing economy is going. In the few years, what is going to happen to some of the car big, big industries in Europe. For instance, in Czech Republic, we have Škoda. We have German car, like BMW, which is my favorite. Now, if according to the delegate from Estonia, looking at the population of Estonia, and looking at the population of Czech Republic of 10 million, 1 million, or 2 million Estonia, and we talk of German, up to 6 million or plus, 60 plus million, what will happen to the economy if people stop buying the cars and there are productions of this car every year and to those large quantities? What will happen to them when people have shipped into this Durango? Thank you. Thank you. I would call it a full circle. We started with uh, a disruption talk about what does it mean and uh, why it comes with uh, the concept of sharing. So let's almost end with uh, disruption again. Gentlemen, how do, how, how do you think it is going to be painful if people really start sharing hardcore, if you will, meaning cars, houses, tools? Everything is going to be shared. Uh, I've mentioned uh, an interview with Chantal before this event. Uh, there's this interesting piece by a Danish MP and uh, she said I think it's 2030, obviously it's an opinion piece, and it says uh, it's 2030, I don't own anything and I'm happy. Do you see it the same way? Maybe if I start around, just uh, I think they, they will have to, innovation will be key and will be necessary. Innovation enormous thing, uh, of an enormous leap, further leaps, because also we will have, but I see, hopefully, you know, one, one uh, ray of hope could be we will gain, if we share more, for example, cars, we will gain a lot of time. So we will uh, have a lot of time to, to use other things. And uh, one recommendation to the manufacturing industry in Europe is uh, produce stuff that we then use in this game time, hopefully. Well, we think there are two, two ways, the, the lowest and then the highest. The law is, is that it's, it's a hype to a certain extent. Uh, it's going to create a few percent of GDP of any country, maybe more, maybe less, but it's going to be a part of it. So the regulator has to adapt. The, the other extreme is that uh, it's, it's a fifth or whichever industrial revolution. Some economists are saying that, including some Czech. Um, um, uh, I tend personally to be a more on this that part of, uh, of, of, of the scale uh, and there it's, 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 it's a new technology no one can predict no one in this in this world so the only way is uh, as I was saying here a few, a few times is to trying to keep pace legislation will always be behind it has always had 
it's natural but us to try to keep up and not, not just stop by thinking, yes, now I have done it, now I can go. I, I totally agree and, uh, and echo here. I mean, it will happen anyway, whether we like it or not. I mean, people are not using mobile phones with buttons anymore. So maybe somebody has still, but, uh, but everybody in Estonia used to have a Nokia 5110, so, so with, a, with a nice ringtone and, and so on and so on, and Ericsson phones, again, uh, with buttons. Nobody's using them anymore. So for transportation, we used, uh, we used horses in old times. Of course, they as well uh, protested against uh, the public transportation provided, uh, provided by, by cars later on. But what, what, what I see, and we are lucky, we don't have any specific sector in Estonia that our economy is lying on. So we, have, we are the platform for all the sectors where uh, you can make hustle-free business. So, but, but for Czech Republic, for Germany, for France, where they have automotive industry, I think that this is the potential for the next Nokia case. So, so uh, be aware uh, to, uh, to, to change. I mean, Elon Musk, Musk is uh, already, already uh, let's say, um, uh, building their uh, gigafactories in, uh, in Europe. So the latest uh, one uh, to, to Finland, to Vasa. So, so they even uh, consider Estonia for the, for the factory, but, uh, but, they, but they chose uh, uh, Finland. So, so there must be a reason why among top ten uh, multinationals uh, in the field of digitals are, are, are not Europeans. So European companies. All of them are Amazon, Google, so uh, name it. None, none of them are based from, uh, from, uh, from Europe. So there must be a reason. And I think that, uh, that we could change that if we want to see the bright future. Or we would like to keep up with the current situation, not with the pace, but with the current situation, try to protect it in somehow, and then uh, then believe that uh, that it will it will change. But one day, people want the change. Today, they are happy to to consume Uber, which is not uh, regulated, and uh, and they are not afraid of, of getting penalties. But one day, they, they want that uh, this service is illegal uh, next to next to taxi service or. Or, or, or blah blah car uh, next to uh, next to let's say uh, bus, uh, bus buses or trains to to go for the longer distances. Kalle Palling, MP from Estonia, Jan Havlik, Ministry of Trade and Industry, and Hubert Gams, DG Group. I got it correctly, right? Excellent. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you for your thoughts, your comments. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your participation for your attention. Uh, looking forward to see you again in year times and in 15 years time. As I said, we're gonna play this video and laugh at ourselves. There is a, yeah, is a Deshnik? Yeah. There's a light refreshment, good wine and a pot possibility to network at Deshnik Cafe, which is not far from here. And if you're not local, ask one of those who are. For instance, me or Yaro Antal. Can you stand up, please, Yaro? That's the nice uh, gentleman over there. Thanks very much to not all of you, not only all of you, as I said, but also University of Economics, the Faculty of International Relations, uh, and Dekan Josef Bauscher. Thank you very much. Prize Waterhouse Coopers, all our media partners, have a good evening and enjoy sharing. Bye.